it's over the last year and two that haven't happened and I'm just thinking maybe some of that could be borrowed for that question okay on, on the budgeting side that would be something that the director of finance would have to answer the the land sale reserve fund is a flexible fund that it could be drawn from I did speak speak to the director of finance in regards to that that was her recommendation I don't know whether it could be drawn from a capital project or not uh, Okay, CAO. Mr. Mayor, um, we could move money from one reserve fund to another as long as it's not um, encumbered by some external body, which our capital reserve fund is generally not. Uh, I'm not aware that our capital reserve fund has any money or adequate funds in there. We have funds allocated for specific capital projects. If Council would like to consider um, reversing um, direction on those budgets, then, then you're at liberty to spend that freed up money. But it, there's not a reserve fund that has um, funding in my, in my um, awareness that is is available for this and so the um, Mr. Smith's correct the director of finance has recommended that this come from land sale reserve okay I'd like to see this happen council and, and wherever the money comes from frankly is not as important as the fact that we move ahead and not indicate to the the owner of this Prop the current owner of this property and the public that we're in any way, shape, or form waffling on it. I think we're, you know, we're pretty determined as a council that we want to keep uh, focused on public safety, and I'd say that's what we need to, to do and not give a message that we're slowing down. Uh, Councillor Paulson. Yeah, I mean, this building has been on the table since this council came into existence four years ago, and through two incarnations, I'm sure that this owner was fully aware when he bought the property of um, the restrictions and, and um, problems that the building had. He's referred to an engineering report and he's also referred in this letter to an architect has provided a clear time frame to get this work done. <coughs> um, I think this has been mentioned in the past, but we've never seen anything that, I, I don't think anything from an architect or anything has come across your desk, has it? An architect did yeah. submit some information in June that laid out a framework and some timing to be able to do a, a review of the building, a code analysis of the building, come up with an accurate rehabilitation plan and cost estimate. Nothing's moved forward on that, as far as we know. To, to the best of my knowledge, you didn't move forward on that because council reconfirmed its resolution to, to proceed. Okay, uh, anything else, council? Uh, Councilor Sobe, last comment? Yeah, just one little concern that I have that I, he, uh, he noted him that he's been told by city staff that he can't spend money and hope that council will allow him to move forward. Did that statement come from yourself or? Because well, I, I just don't want to give him false hopes and I, I don't want him to be starting spending his hard earned money on something that we've already decided on. So I just would hate to. He's making allegations that staff says, well, maybe if you do spend some money and invest, maybe it'll change the mind of council, because it's pretty clear to me that council has not changed their mind. So I just don't want him to be starting to waste his hard-earned money on this. Well, and, and how Mr. Letourneau uh, decides to spend his money is Mr. Letourneau's uh, business. Okay, on the motion, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much. Okay, Council, that brings us then to staff reports. Uh, first one is accounts. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the certification of the Director of Finance dated August 13, 2018 be received in checks number <coughs> 141820 to 142049 inclusive and payments of accounts totaling $8,264,474.36 be approved. Seconder. I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Any discussion? All those in favor? Carried. And presentation of the annual report. Uh, City Clerk, I'll turn it over to you to introduce this item, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <coughs> the community charter requires that an annual report be prepared each year that includes um, audited financial statements, list of permissive tax exemptions that have been approved by council, a report respecting municipal services and operations for the previous year, a progress report respecting the previous year in relation to the objectives and measures established, a statement of municipal objectives, 
and measures used to determine progress for the current and the next year, and any other information the Council considers advisable. Um, the annual report must be considered at an annual meeting at least 14 days after it has been made available for inspection by the public and an opportunity given for public input and questions. This annual report contains unaudited financial statements as the audited statements are not yet available and this has been reflected and noted in the report. The report was made available to the public on July 27th and notice has been provided of the annual meeting uh, held today, August 13th. And uh, Mr. Mayor, just before Council uh, discusses the report, I'd just like to acknowledge the work that Elishara, Manager of Communications, has put into preparing this, um, along with help from Col Colleen May, our uh, Program Secretary at Parks and Recreation. And uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Alicia, see you sitting in the back. Thank you very much for the, for the report. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the public on the annual report? Uh, Council, any questions or comments? Councillor Sobey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I understand it's been uh, delivered electronically uh, to the community and sort, but is there going to be hard copies available for anybody else that wish to have a good? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, there will be hard copies available. We haven't made too many at this point because we need Council to endorse the report um, first. But once Council endorses it, we'll make some additional copies. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else, Council? Then, Councillor McClemon, are you able to make a motion to endorse the annual report? I move the Council City of Port, Alberni, Port Alberni endorse the annual report for the year ended December 31st, 2017, as presented. Is there a seconder? I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Any discussion? All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, Council, which brings us then to the McLean Mill Society, a monthly report, and uh, certainly a place that I spend a fair amount of time at on the weekend. <coughs> so, who's presenting? You're both presenting. Please Thank come you. forth. Welcome, Shane. I know. <laughs> Um, so Deanna and I are both going to present today. As Council knows, um, there's been a change in um, Executive Director at McLean Mill. The bookkeeper and the um, past president have resigned. So uh, the um, remaining directors have asked me to act as president. Um, Mel Franker is acting as vice president. Um, Duane is staying on as treasurer and Jorge is going to act as um, secretary and Rod and Lyndon are staying on as other directors at large. Um, the bookkeeping services have been handed over to Rob Anderson Associates and they are um, working on those diligently. We don't unfortunately have the finances ready for today to hand to you but they assure me that we will have them soon and we will send them to you as soon as we get them. We don't have any concerns at this point in terms of not meeting our budget for the year. Uh, other kind of items of note that Deanna will talk about more fully are the number seven has recently been taken out of service and requires a full retube. tube so we're working with the IHS on determining uh, what next steps look like for that beloved steam engine. Um, we're also, there was a successful grant application for the roof that's uh, really challenging out there. So we're working on that. And also I'm happy to say that we have a signed agreement with the IHS. We've been meeting um, a lot. <laughs> and we've, uh, I think we're all pretty happy with what we've come up with. So, so all in all, I think we're back on track for a good summer. And uh, now I'll hand it over to Deanna unless you've got any questions before, uh, for me before. Yeah, Councilor Sui. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one qu uh, question for bookkeeping services. Are we going to be retaining Mr. Anderson's service permanently or is this just temporarily until the board figures out what to do? So I think we're going to talk with um, Rob Anderson Associates about what the best uh, step forward is and come to council with those options and then we can all kind of decide what's the best approach. Okay. And just one quick thing before we turn it over to Deanna. You, you mentioned there's a change in the executive director. Oh, so, sorry. I just meant the executive of the board. So Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, I, I thought that's what yeah, it was, but no, I just, yeah, uh, yeah. she's sorry, standing I, yeah, right there, so it, she yeah. doesn't look any no, different. No, she's right she? here. <laughs> <laughs> no change there. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for me or? 
Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you very much, Sheena. <laughs> Sorry, Diana. <laughs> we got a, it's like twins right here. She it's normally like, has a stool to stand on, but we don't exactly. have that. Yeah. Mr. Mayor and Council, thank you for uh, receiving our reports. So it's been a little while since I've been in front of you. I have a bit to report now that we're into our thickest and heaviest uh, operational point of year. And we've got, um, I hear a lot online that I seem to be only reporting successes. It's because we are doing quite well still. We have had our challenges and we'll talk about the number seven. But overall, the site itself is doing very well. We have fully opened up our campground. Hooray, that took a year, but really pleased we haven't had a dry day since the beginning of July. And I mean, a dry day, there hasn't been a vacant spot since July. We had a lovely PR marketing ploy that went out there and it reached almost, at this point, 60,000 people. So it's been uh, going around the island. We were talking about how we uh, are the last open campground. And that started quite a bit of stir because technically there are so few open campgrounds on Vancouver Island that we were able to squeeze into that niche market and people are stopping. It's such a unique opportunity to be able to camp in a national historic site. And by allowing this new demographic, we're allowing the site to expand its use. That was one of the things that we decided to do right off the bat with um, all the different visioning processes with our strategic plan. But by doing this this year and seeing these families that are coming and they get to walk and explore after we close to the public. And it's quite busy, particularly on train days, where it's just this serene place that can walk and stroll and explore, visit the forest, just really have that sense of walking in tried and traveled steps of people that came before us. It's rich, so rich in history, and it's just tapping into a brand new demographic. So I am so, so pleased to do with that. Um, couple of interesting things. So we've been running our trains four days a week this year. That's the same as last year. We are using different locomotives. Clearly, you would have heard lots of steam whistle and then late at night steam whistle and now, unfortunately, no steam whistle. We uh, did all of our regular maintenance and just sort of like out of the blue, as with antiquated equipment happens sometimes, we've uncovered three tubes that needed to be re retubed. I'm, I'm sorry. Retubed. I'm learning, guys. But uh, and that brought some closer inspection, which has brought us to the realization now that the entire tubing process has to be done. There's about 68 of them, so it's cost prohibitive for us this year. But what I will say that has come as a, a total um, worth every second of our time with that engine is that we have uncovered succinctly what it costs to run. So when we began this last year, we were really unsure of all the true costs related to our steam locomotive with our locomotives and the track. So as much as we recognize there's definitely a love in the community for this locomotive, we also recognize from the business side of everything, we can look at this with a uh, clean slate and say, this is what we need, this is what we need to fund. And then when we make our decisions going into our budget in 2019, that those awarenesses that were sort of a mystery before, now we can make sync decisions so that's better business for all of us so we're going to be coming together in the fall to look at that and to decide what will be best course of action i am certain that we'll be joining with ihs of course but also coming to the community to have some conversations this is going to be a, a wide decision not just one that we make quietly uh, going forward we are open in our restaurant seven days a week we realized this year that um Having that we have a lot of walk-on traffic, there was a really awesome opportunity to keep the cafe open. So we're, we're seeing that a lot of our guests are coming just simply to have a bite to eat and to meander around even on non-train days. So that in itself is something that I think is new and it's growing, the advertisement's growing. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting that we're doing, we've brought back music in the park. I'm not sure if, uh, I've seen a few of you out there, which I appreciate, really, Pulling from our local talent pool, so a lot of young musicians or folks that are local to the Alberni Valley or the region, giving them some exposure. It's so beautiful to play under the maple. You're sitting on a deck. There's just a nice ambience there. It just really brings that really chill vibe. So really looking at ways to expand usage. We just hosted our second wedding of the year this past weekend, which brings me to this past weekend which I appreciated seeing many of your faces out there this weekend. Um, we held for the fourth time in the Alberni Valley, the second time partnered with us as a McLean Mill Society, the 
Shaker Music and Arts Festival. I have to admit, I am like a mother hen overseeing everything, quite nervously holding my breath. I, uh, I realized I was in my yoga class this morning that I exhaled finally. We didn't have one thing to communicate to council that was negative. Every single piece of that festival went off without a hitch. We had an absolute no tolerance plan for any kind of fire smoking. Uh, we had protection of assets was of course number one we actually reconfigured the whole festival so there was a six foot fence almost guarding the entire property so everything was really contained into like a a figure eight almost be, with the shady acre area down below i found out just before council over 2200 people walked through those gates that's amazing that's amazing amazing people that were coming from as far away as vancouver and seattle just for this festival couldn't believe it was being held on a National Historic Site. We had CBC there, Chick, Check 6 News, bloggers, one of them who has over 100,000 followers taking photos at this festival. I feel that we're on to something. Our town is really getting known. One of your shirts from the chamber today is Festival Friday, I believe it was called. We're getting known for our community gatherings. It's one of the things that makes Port Alberni so great and how we can create that awesome community feel. There's many things that we do to contribute to community, but that's one of them. So I couldn't be more pleased with the team and our board and our support, the IHS. We had actually some items that were left in the vicinity so we could just share that historic asset. There were tours done for campers this morning so they could have the real McLean Mill experience which I thought was very interesting. People were interested in history. They were being introduced to it. And that's what we want. We want exposure on the property. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Councillor Sovey, then Councillor McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One question I have, and, uh, and it's awesome to hear that we're bringing so much into the McLean Mill with the five acre shaker. And uh, I have to be honest with you, the biggest concern I had was the protection of the assets and so forth and uh, working along with IHS to ensure that these assets are not manipulated or you know damaged or anything like that is has there been any challenges to protecting these assets that you might find not really because we have uh, barriers first of all so um, it's actually up to the uh, mill so the mill right so the first bridge that's where the festival stops so they're not touching any of the mechanical area nor any of the logging area the only people that were there this weekend were the wedding that overlapped with the music festival. That was a whole other thing on another conversation. But, and then we have snow fencing protecting, and then of course there's round the clock security. And then, you know what, to be honest though, our guests were so respectful of the fact that we were here. Everyone knew that this is a big deal. This is something that we have to work together to do and do this together. Not, I think we had two people that were ejected for smoking. That was it. That's all I have to report. So protection of asset is always because, I mean, in this time right now where it's so hot and fire is such a risk and then we had two fires burning right on either side of us, I, I probably have a few extra gray hairs than I did a week ago, <laughs> but that is, it wasn't an issue and we had security and volunteers, hundreds of them looking around and then no guests that were even attempted to damage anything. I was pleased with everyone's decor, decorum, it was good. Councillor McClellan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just a question. Um, are you having much feed uh, pushback, the fact we don't have a steam train? And I'm just looking at your picture here in the report. It shows a steam train. Should we be maybe not putting that out there until we have it running again? Or what do you think about that? I, I hear some complaints. They, they advertise a steam train and it's not there. I don't know how serious they are or if there's anyone that would go anyway or what. So I'm just curious. Well, given that this is probably the most public announcement that we've made, this is all brand new information. Literally four or five days ago is when the actual decision came about. Um, we're not saying that there's no steam train, but now we need to look at what the process will be. One of the things that I personally learned through this is we've fought tooth and nail to bring that engine back this year. I found that just having the communication with the community and our guests, people really love the engine. But what they love more is the experience of riding the train. So we haven't had too much pushback from, I guess we had to change two weddings that were booked on steam and then turn them into our diesel locomotive. We're going to, this gives us an opportunity. We have three engines in our fleet here. So let's talk about the great things and the great qualities and perhaps 
This looks like a, a plan that we go in, a restoration plan where we fundraise. So we're not saying that there will be no steam and we're not saying that everyone isn't um, impartial to it. There's so much love because it's a very unique locomotive, but so is the Alco. The Alco is a train that with a little bit of lipstick, I'm just saying that from my perspective, I would love to see it having a bit of a facelift, maybe some paint, bring it back to its, its colors. We'll talk with the museum about that. Um, our guests love that they're riding over three trestles, that they're riding on a historic steam train, that they're getting to see this second growth forest and all the assets of the community, passing cars, everyone waves. We have this amazing thing here. So we have to really look at numbers. That's what we've been doing since the beginning of our society. And that will be helping us to make decisions. And as I said, we'll take into account what the community wants and what our guests want. That's gonna be some fact finding that we're doing going forward. And Mrs. Anderson. Oh, she is just the most wonderful woman on the planet. Do you know that she also coordinates the food, the read and feed program for the community? She is just an amazing volunteer. Yeah. Flag Lady Sally. Um, Councillor Alamany. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you about your comments for you know the the trying to get the steam back. I think I think it's good that you're going to turn it into a community process, and uh, I think if you were to uh, put it out there as a, as a community funded process, I'm willing to bet there would be a lot of interest in that. Uh, so that'll be really interesting. Um, other than that, I just wanted to say I was up at the Shaker uh, a couple days and uh, it was a fantastic event. Um, the, just the comments that you heard walking around, um, people were happy, people were aware of the fires obviously. Um, and I think that made people, uh, you know, that had no connection to the Alberni Valley, um, mm -hmm. that much more respectful of, of the place and, uh, and careful of what they were doing. So um, just congratulations on, on putting that weekend together. I think uh, uh, it's a great start to uh, you know, what can come in the future. Thank you. I have two more comments that I just wanted to uh, make note of as we're public here in council. So one of the things that we did that wasn't part of our plan this year, but I would like to just acknowledge the hard work Taking the time to build the property out to prepare it for a, a massive infrastructure festival like this took a ton of work. We had volunteers that were no affiliation with McLean Mill Society nor with IHS and we know that we have the best volunteers in these two organizations. Heart and soul goes out to this property for years and years and years. We were able to um, invite into this family, if you will, a new demographic. So folks that were out there like yourself, I was very impressed to see you out there, Mr. Mayor, just building, uh, offering services for big machinery, offering things, just uh, wanting to contribute to do this. And with that, we were able to begin phase two of our campground, which will be the tenting area. That likely won't actually open up until next season, but I wanted to acknowledge that that hard work, they were out there for eight to 10 weekends just succinctly, so super great. I'm amazed by the volunteers in this community, always. And the second thing, we had done a, uh, a study with the museum, Jamie was leading it. We were able to find out in, um, we were able to find out exactly in prioritized order which buildings and which assets actually are requiring the most work in the most immediate succession. So I wanted to announce to you today, and I'm not gonna say too much about it today, but please mark your calendars for October 11th. We are hosting the kickoff to a, a Raise the Roof campaign. So we're looking at bringing in some community funding. We're going to be doing our first McLean Mill Society large scale fundraiser. And as we unveil the next steps in this process, it's really important that we come together and we bring some financial um, fundraising coming back into the historic, society, this is historic site. So, Mark your calendars, October 11th. Hope to see all of your smiling faces. And if there's anything else? Uh, just, just two things. Sorry, got to go way down again. <laughs> so we just wanted to mention that we're hosting on Thursday from 5.30 to 6.30 a public information session. So anybody can come out to the mill from 5.30 to 6.30 and ask any questions of the board or staff out there. And also just want to thank... Um, all the people we've been working so hard with, so the IHS and city staff and volunteers and staff at the site, everybody's been really great this summer. So we just couldn't be more pleased with all the relationships we've got. So just for clarity, is this every Tuesday or just this next Tuesday? 
Thursday, uh, just this Thursday. Oh, just this Thursday, yeah. certain. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. So if anybody's, and if people have other questions, they can always feel free to contact um, Deanna or myself or any of the board, so. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Yep. Just a quick question for Deanna. Um, music in the park, what days and what times is that on? Always, sorry, always on Sundays and then 11.30 to 2.30. So as our train arrives, very chill, come out and have lunch. Um, some great in acts book for the next couple as well, so we'd love to see you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McClemon, are you able to make the motion to receive the report, please? Move that the monthly report, including current initiatives and the executive director of the McLean Mill Society, be received. I'll second that motion, Mr. Mayor. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. And uh, from the Director of Development Services, uh, temporary use permit uh, for 40, 5405 Argyle Street uh, can be found on page 65. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, so we've received an application for a temporary use permit for 5405 Argyle Street for uh, office use for a portion of the building for a three-year term. The city's uh, official community plan does allow Council to consider temporary use permit uh, under uh, a number of under a policy um, so this building is uh, immediately at the at the entrance of Harbor Key uh, it's kind of in the area where the majority of the surrounding uses are waterfront industrial and some of the waterfront commercial is a little closer to the inlet itself although this does have some 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 uh, mainly commercial uses in it uh, the property has had some vacancies over the last several years. Uh, there's a mix of current uses, including a restaurant, marine electronics. Uh, there's a small office currently operating without a business license. A kayak rental outdoor store recently opened. And the, the new owners have been uh, investing in this, uh, in this, business, in this building uh, pretty significantly and have had some opportunities for, for further office use. Now, the, the property is zoned uh, W1, which is our waterfront commercial zone, and that zone was primarily intended for marine-based and tourist-related activities, and so office is not currently a permitted use in the zone, and, but this temporary use permit would allow uh, some office use in there over potentially a three-year term, which would allow both the property owner and the city to evaluate how, the, how that functions in that area. Um, it does comply with the policy set out in our official community plan for consideration of a temporary use permit. Uh, one uh, consideration in there is that there, there is no on-site parking on this property and that's uh, fairly similar for a lot of Harbor Key and the uptown area and it's not required uh, by our bylaw. Um, so employees of an office would not be able to park in this immediate, in the immediate area. There is longer term parking in, in a little bit further area, but that's uh, an issue to consideration. But the landlord, when he's leasing the property, clearly indicates to any potential tenant that there isn't, there isn't parking uh, immediately on site. The city's advisory planning commission did consider this application, did provide its support for two office units uh, for a period of three year term. Um, after the advisory planning commission meeting was held the property owner submitted a letter to to mayor and council requesting that a third office unit be be considered uh, city council uh, agreed with that request that the third unit be be considered as part of this temporary use permit uh, the third unit is is a second floor unit currently uh, occupied longshoremen uh, with their leases being up in potentially not being uh, renewed. So the proposed uh, temporary use permit would allow office use to be occupied for a portion of the building. It's recommended that the offices be limited to a, a total of three office units with the specific units being identified in the temporary use permit. Again, this would uh, allow both the uh, property owner and city count, the city to evaluate how offices uh, function in that space and um, uh, the, the development service department does support uh, the issuance of this temporary use permit. Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions for Mr. Smith? Councilor McClendon? Yeah, I, I, I'm in favor of anything that's going to help uh, get commercial 
things happening really anywhere in the valley and down there at the bottom of Argyle you know it, there's there's a lot of small businesses and I think that's good and that building has a definitely a lot of potential and I don't see a problem with granting this at the moment the only question I have and this is something that uh, keeps coming back uh, at us I guess is do, do these do the owners of this building own any other property in town uh, do we have any track record that they'll do as they're saying we've had a few in the valley that kind of start and I'm looking at one coming up our third avenue right now that kind of start and quit and looks pretty terrible I'm not aware if uh, I mean the applicant and the owner is is in is here uh, he could tell you whether he owns other uh, properties they sir, they have already invested in this building a, a substantial amount of money uh, but maybe mr. Tour could uh, indicate whether he owns other properties Welcome, Mr. Tour. Thank you. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but no, we don't own other uh, property locally. Um, I'm from the Lower Mainland. I actually moved out to Banfield working for the First Nation for the last two and a half years um, with the idea that uh, we fell in love with the area, so um, the goal is to remain here. Um, we've actually got a beautification grant from the city for the exterior of the building as well, So, and we've started on collecting supplies. So the building will actually look beautiful in a few months. It'll be wrapped in cedar. I've been working with an architect that the city provided as well in terms of the exterior of the building. Um, yeah, but in terms of direct property that we own, in terms of other commercial property, no. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you very much. So we'll see how you, good you do down here. It'll give you a good chance. Yeah. Councillor Minions and then Councillor Paulson. Thank you, um, since you're up here. Um, have the spaces, have you tried to find um, tenants for the spaces that would suit the current zoning? Yeah. Um, so essentially, um, before is it probably the storage we spent about 100 grand so far on the interior um, and uh, I, we were unaware of the zoning prior to this until uh, the one office that did come in there that office that's in there currently is actually working in unison with us on the exterior of the building um, they're actually providing the seats the cedar for the exterior to, to wrap the building um, so uh, ideal like we've looked for tenants um, there's a lot of commercial space that's available um, there are a total of seven units so this would just be potentially two units and potentially the third upstairs unit if they don't renew their lease um, with the idea that it gives us a bit of an option and, and the potential to have more return on the actual building. Um, ideally, for my current tenants, they'd prefer retail. Uh, reason being more foot traffic for them. Um, so ideally, we'd want to do what's best for our current tenants. Yeah, I think that's my big concern is, um, I mean, I understand you want to rent the space and we all want to see an investor in the community being successful in what they're doing. Um, but I think the Harbour Key is zoned as it is to drive foot traffic and to increase foot traffic and office space has a way of decreasing, um, you know, foot traffic to that area because it's not, it's not the intended use. Um, so I just, I wondered if you had advertised it. Um, to a degree. So the, the only rebuttal that I have there is when purchasing the building, there was maybe one and a half tenants in the overall space. Now you'll actually have eight units that are all that are all that are all viable businesses essentially. So um, I can see how it would attract, but it's still more than what was there prior. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I agree. It's a positive for the community. Um, I just think office space um, is not necessarily what that you what we should be looking to attract down there. Um, so I, I wondered if you had advertised it because we do have an excess of vacant space in this community. You're absolutely right on that. The fact that you have invested, um, we have very few spaces that are actually suitable for small businesses to open up in. So you've created something that's a good thing for the community. Um, but I just wondered if you would be able to fill it with kind of use that it's intended for there so if you have advertised then that answers my question yeah and okay. you've noticed that by the new tenants that are currently there right so yeah, there, is absolutely. A, there is one that just opened up the great last few months. and then just one question for the director of development services um i think so <laughs> um you, we're talking about the second floor unit as well um does the harbor key zoning currently allow for offices on the second floor not in the waterfront commercial zone okay so, so again, that's why it's included in the temporary use permit that would allow that to occur. Okay. I think that's something as a council we should look at going forward because um, second floor units we should absolutely be able to make use of for office space. That's a great space for offices to be, and we do have a shortage of offices in the community. 
in the waterfront industrial zone, offices allowed in the second floor, there's actually very little two-story mm -hmm. uh, waterfront commercial. It, so most of it is all one level, and that might have been the reason why it wasn't written into the zoning bylaw. I'm yeah. not 100% sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paulson. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Tour for having the um, confidence in our community to invest in that building. And um, I have a bit of a history down there as much as I worked in a sporting goods store down in that corner there for many, many years, 10 years. And then out of respect um, with Councilor Minions, uh, with the previous owners, actually my boss was one of the owners. And they tried and tried and struggled and struggled. They, they even had to build to suit uh, with regards to tenants and stuff. And that particular building, for some reason, nobody bit on the retail end of it. And that, that was over 15 years of a period of time. So that building has a long history in our community of having uh, vacant and, and um, empty spaces in it. And if it can be filled, I think action begets action, whether it's office or whether it's retail. And uh, good on you for, for investing in our community. Thank you. If you need to know anything about the building, I know where all the plumbing and stuff is, too. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Alleman. Thank you. Um, so my, my concern, I think, was addressed a little bit by Mr. Tour, so that's great. But um, I think what I see down there is, uh, you know, there, are, there have been empty storefronts for a very long time, and I think it's very valuable for us to take the opportunity that um, we're being given to be able to fill those spaces. Um, I, I disagree somewhat with Councillor Minions. I think, I think there's, a, there's an ability um, to have more permanent foot traffic if there is more commercial space and office space in an, in an area and, and maybe that's the second floor um, you know if we can focus on on uh, increasing the amount of uh, space on second floor so that we can then fill retail spaces then uh, then that's a that's a positive um, but as it is I think maybe the three-year term is where I I get hung up a little bit about um, you know if we're gonna test this out to see if the commercial space works um, maybe rather than a three-year term, I would be more comfortable with uh, something like 18 months so that the next council can go ahead and, and you know, see how that um, goes through. And then uh, if they want to make a permanent change to the zoning, then you can make a permanent change. Um, and if not, the, the temporary use permit could be renewed, could it not? Oh, the temp so the temporary use permit is, has a finite time. Right. So right now it's being asked for, for three years. There is the ability for the applicant to ask for one renewal, right. um, but that's but then the, it that reaches that after. that yeah. max. But I would say, after a period of time, both the property owner and the council should decide is office an appropriate use in this area, and then make a decision. And if they are going to feel that it should be in some way, then a change to the zoning bylaw would be appropriate. Yeah. yeah so I I would just feel that you know that 18 months would be. Um, more appropriate than a, than a full three years, but uh, up to council to, to see what that. Okay, thank you, Cal Councillor Washington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I completely disagree with you, <laughs> only because if I was coming into this town and I was investing in something, I'd like it a little more than 18 months for that test. I think the three years is, is, is fair for everybody, so I'll be sticking to the three years. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Paulson. Are you able to move uh, receipt of that? Um, I'd like to move that the report dated August the 8th, 2018 from the Dir Director of Development Services regarding proposed temporary use permit be received. Is there a seconder? Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the receipt? Opposed? Carried. Okay, uh, City Clerk, is there any late correspondence regarding this matter? Uh, there is none, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. And is there any input from the public regarding this matter? Mr. Del Rio. Do I have to give my name and address like normal? Sure. Jim yes, Del please. Rio, 2871 Wait. first, yeah. Um, I've been working on that building now for a year and a half. And when you were saying, yeah, I know where the plumbing, everything is brand new. All the wiring is new, all the plumbing is new. That building is gorgeous. The outside doesn't look that great, but like he was commenting on, there's all the Procedures there they're just waiting for permits to go ahead to put it on the front commercial uh, I think the three-year plan would be good 
Um, I know there is a business down there right now without a business license, which I will go and ask them about because they are a very big company in this town. They probably just didn't think they needed one. I'm not too sure, but uh, but I think the three-year thing would be really good. Like you say, he's they've invested. Uh, uh, him and his dad have invested a lot more than a hundred thousand dollars down there because I've been on most of it. You know, that's just a, that's just a, everything's everything's brand new. Everything in that building is brand new. Insulation, it's and it's all overkill. Like it wasn't just up to code. It's way overkill on insulation, on firewalls. Everything is way overkill. All brand new furnaces, all brand new plumbing. There's new roof too, isn't there? Yep, new roof. Uh, Eve's. Like they say, they got the cedar there. They're just waiting for the go ahead. Okay, so that's just my opinion. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Anything else from public? Okay, then, Councillor Paulson, are you able to make that last motion, please? Uh, that this, the council for the city of Port Alberni approve temporary use permit 18-01, and the mayor and city clerk be authorized to sign the permit. Seconder. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Post carried. Thank you. Then, Council, that brings us to uh, development permit number 18-01. Uh, Thirty-seven seventy-four Twelfth Avenue, I believe. Just get my machine back up and running. Um, we have a report dated August the 7th from the Director of Development Services regarding consideration of an application for development permit uh, number 18-01 to facilitate phase two of Terrace Lane, which is, for those of you that have been around for a while, known as the old Calgary School property. So it's in behind the Plaza mm -hmm. Shopping Center there. Um, I guess you have to be really old to know that. <laughs> Even you knew that. Okay. Uh, so, any discussion, Council? Any questions? Uh, director, do you need to make any explanations for Council? Just a quick over overview. Sure, just a quick. So, this is the, the second phase to this project. They've, the developers changed their, their uh, development slightly. It, it, it was originally proposed for two triplexes, like the first phase, and they, they're staying with the same number of units, but building six. Uh, individual small little patio homes of two different types, uh, both two bedroom, two bath, uh, good quality units, and uh, the Development Service Department certainly does support this development permit. Okay. And I'd be pleased to answer questions. Any questions, Council? No. Then, Councillor Sovey, are you able to make this motion, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That Council for the City of Port Alberni approved development permit number 18 01 and that the City Clerk be authorized to sign the permit. Seconder? Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. And from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, uh, status report, partner in the parks program. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, so in September of 2015, uh, Council uh, received a word from the Canal Beach Water Sports Society suggesting that a potential partner in parks program would be explored. Uh, I recently met with Canal Beach Water Sports Society uh, director and uh, confirmed that their satisfaction with uh, Canal Beach at this stage uh, doesn't warrant uh, moving forward with the Partner in Parks program at this time. So when the Canal Water Sports Society first approached Council uh, three years ago, of course, Canal Beach looked vastly different than it does now. And so they confirmed they're very comfortable with where things are at. So at this stage, it's staff's recommendation that we would continue to work with community members if they have inquiries or questions or ideas about parks, recreation, and heritage services, we would move forward directly working with community. Okay, thank you. Any questions, Council? No. Councillor Paulson, are you able to make that motion then, please? Uh, I'd like to move that the report that the report dated July 3rd, 2018, from Parks Operations Supervisor providing, oops, sorry, wrong one, oops. That the report from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage dated July 20th, 2018, providing information regarding a partner in Parks program be received. I'll second that motion, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carry. Thank you. And from Parks Operations Supervisor, status report on uh, Bob Daly Stadium uh, running track surface. 
Welcome. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to uh, say that I met with the uh, contractor at the beginning of July, and we did a walkabout, and we, <clears throat> we both admitted that there was some issues still with the truck. And actually, the following weekend, we had more issues, another new tear by uh, a user group. But uh, just regardless of saying that, we did come to an agreement on a three-year extension on the warranty, and he is going to come before the end of the summer to do the current repairs that are there, and we'll carry on. So after each winter, we're going to do a site visit together around April, and then discuss when it would be appropriate time to um, repair. But we didn't want to interfere with any of the ongoings of all summer, really. So we've been using it up to this weekend. So. Um, so we're hoping it was supposed to be end of July, but now it's going to look like it's more towards September. So, so with that tear there and a lot of public use on there, any issue with safety as far as public using? No, that? not yet. No. Okay. No, it is starting to pull a little bit, so I've been monitoring. I just don't want to put duct tape there for a reason for another month. So we are monitoring it and myself. So I do. A, I would do a walk about every user group that uh, does it. I could afford to lose more weight, so we'll do it from there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor okay. uh, Survey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, awesome that we're able to get that three year extension warranty. I know Mr. Neil Anderson uh, is going to be happy to hear that. Uh, with the recent small damages that are there, who's responsible for repairing <coughs> that? And That's is something we have to have a meeting about. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. I just want to make sure there's a certain cost recovery. And uh, thank you very much for okay. negotiating that. No Thanks. problem. Thank you. Okay, anything else, Council? Then, Councillor Paul uh, Sylvia, do you want to uh, make the motion then, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That the report dated July 3rd, 2018, from the Parks Operations Supervisor providing information regarding the warranty on the Bob Daly Stadium track surface be received. Is there a seconder? Second, Mr. Mayor. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Oh, opposed? Sorry. Carried. Thank you. And, uh, from the city clerk, we have uh, Harbor Key lease uh, uh, pertaining to uh, Unit 10 and Unit 16 uh, for Homestead uh, Cookhouse. Uh, city clerk, just a brief overview for us, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, the uh, current owner of the Homestead Cookhouse is in the process of, of selling um, the business. This uh, new lease or new leases for Units 10 and 16 are with the new owners. Um, for a two-year term. I think the business changes hands this week, uh, so the lease commences on August the 15th, um, each one for a two-year term. Okay, thank you. Any questions, Council? Uh, Councillor Sobe? Uh, just very sad to see um, for the Homestead Cookhouse leaving uh, that location. So a big thank you for herself and her husband for all the services she's rendered at Harbour Key. Her food will surely be missed by myself anyways and uh, that's it thank you okay uh, Councillor Alamani are you able to make these uh, motions please yes sir that uh, council for the city of Port Alberni authorized the mayor and clerk to enter into a lease for unit 10 at the Alberni Harbor Key with Young Quan Park and Su Wu Nan for a two-year term commencing August 15th 2018 at the current monthly rent of three hundred twenty four dollars and twenty cents per month plus GST Seconder? Second, Mr. Mayor. Any further discussion? Councillor Sobe? Uh, are we aware if they're just going to be taking over the business or is it going to be a different approach as into what they're going to be servicing there? The conditions of the lease, Mr. Mayor, are the same as previous, so the intent <coughs> to continue to operate the business in the same manner that it has been. So you're saying that Councillor Sobe has been rescued? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, thank you. On the motion then, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And Councillor Alamani for the second one? That Council for the City of Port Alberni authorized the Mayor and Clerk to enter into a lease for Unit 16 at the Alberni Harbour Key with Young Quan Park and Su Soon Wu Nan for a two year term commencing August 15th, 2018, at the current monthly rent of $290.53 per month plus GST. Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favour? Carried. And, uh, Council, that brings us to uh, the uh, lease of the property to North Island College. Uh, just a quick question, City Clerk. Uh, this is, is how many decades have we been leasing this property to North Island College? 
I'm not sure when the initial lease started, Mr. Mayor, but it's certainly been some time. This is for the Tebow campus, of course. Right. And uh, there was <clears throat> hope at some point that they were actually going to purchase the building. Um, and that, to date, certainly has not, not happened. So, but monthly rent of $9,500 is coming our way. So this, this lease is a renewal for a three-year term. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions, Council? Councillor Washington, are you able to make this motion? Please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Move the Council for the City of Port Alberni authorized Mayor and Clerk to enter into a lease agreement with North Island College for the property at 4751 Tebow Avenue for the current monthly rent of $9,574.56 plus applicable taxes to March 31, 2021. I'll second that motion, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. And from the Economic Development Manager, uh, Rural Dividend Grant. Uh, Mr. Deacon, are you able to just give us a five cent version of what you're doing, please? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors, uh, the five second version is uh, that a grant application has been submitted to the Rural Dividend Program. Uh, we need, I need, uh, uh, council resolution or the application will be deemed to be uh, incomplete and not considered. Great. Uh, questions, Council? Then, Councillor Paulson, are you able to make this uh, motion, please? I'd be pleased to. That uh, Council for the City of Port Alberni supports the Port Alberni. Where am I here now? Resident and Oh, yeah. The I'm in holiday mode. <laughs> the Council for the City of Port Alberni supports the Port Alberni Resident and Worker Attraction Campaign application for funding to the Rural Dividend Fund. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor McClemon and Councillor Sobe? Yeah, just, just a question. I'm, I'm reading through the, the application. It, it, how, in what way are we going to be able to attract and how, where are we advertising and cetera with, with this money to attract uh, workers and residents? Uh, well, as uh, the report says, I mean, we're, we intend to uh, not reinvent the wheel, but uh, follow on the work uh, that has been done by uh, Vancouver Island North, who have launched uh, uh, a resident and worker attraction campaign. Uh, same for the Sunshine Coast. Um, who've uh, also done uh, an attraction campaign. And then I would uh, model the uh, employee attraction campaign somewhat based on the work that uh, Quinnell has done. So what the work would actually consist of is that we would, uh, and that's explained more fully in my monthly report uh, to council, which will follow, but it involves creation of uh, videos, uh, professional photographs. Um, it is going to res uh, include some front end research on uh, the views that uh, prospective residents might have about uh, Port Alberni and uh, the area and uh, ways of addressing either uh, concerns that they might have or positive images, ways of leveraging those. Okay. Uh, Councilor Sobe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was a similar question, but one issue I wanted to ask you is what demographic of targets are we trying to attract? And are we speaking with our local industry and speaking with the local uh, entrepreneurship for our town for small businesses? Who are we trying to uh, attract and how are we going to target those? So um, the primary demographic uh, that we're seeking to attract uh, are young families or young uh, people, millennials. Uh, because we're aware that the demographics in the community have really shifted and um, we uh, are becoming uh, somewhat uh, top-heavy, if you will, 
uh, in the older demographics. So um, we are focused on attracting the younger demographic. And yes, we have spoken uh, to a number of organizations that are trying to attract employees. So um, Island Health, uh, North Island College, School District 70, uh, the Colson Group, um, and uh, a couple of others have expressed uh, to us that they've been having difficulty attracting uh, employees uh, more of uh, more professional uh, more skilled employees and there is another way of going about this and that's to invest some time and money in uh, bringing up the skills of the people that we have in the community uh, and uh, uh, the current need is for skilled labor immediately, not uh, two or three or uh, four years down uh, the road. And hopefully we will have that need further down the road as well. Uh, but uh, we have spoken to uh, a number of uh, organizations um, at the um, uh, Canadian Maritime Engineering, uh, also told us that they've got work right now for welders and we have Catalyst uh, Paper and Western Forest Products are telling us they have work right now for uh, individuals to both replace the retiring workforce uh, and uh, add. And is, has there been any, any emphasis on the building a uh, small business startups in the community. I, I understand we're trying to fill certain jobs and uh, educate us into what the community is in need and what the businesses need, but are we actually maybe inviting an uh, individual wanting to start a business in our community, being small? Yeah, um, so uh, the uh, resident attraction campaign will identify opportunities for uh, small business owners. And um, we're also aware uh, that there's a category of uh, entrepreneur out there called the Lone Eagle. Uh, and it's basically individuals uh, who are really focused on the tech sector uh, and who start out alone. Uh, and just want uh, uh, a place uh, where uh, they have access to the internet, high-speed internet, uh, but they also have a lifestyle uh, that they um, enjoy. So um, that uh, would be focused somewhat on those as well. Uh, Councillor Alamani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's a good, I think it's a good idea to uh, promote our community, of course, um, but I'm really glad that you mentioned that there'll be re research going into what uh, potential residents and, and potential people in the workforce are looking for in a community. Um, because, you know, w we do need to fill the, the spots that are available now, um, but in order for you to, to reach the goals that you've set out, which I think are, are great and ambitious, um, we need to be able to change the community in ways that will attract residents on their own without a campaign. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think you'll ever attract enough people with a, with a video or a TV ad. Um, you have to do it because people see a community and then tell their friends about the community and tell their coworkers about the community and say, hey, we should start a new business in that community. Um, so I'm really glad that you're putting that focus into um, you know, what you're looking for in terms of uh, the residents uh, and what what sort of the needs are of the community to be able to change uh, yeah. more so than, than a campaign, a marketing campaign. That's uh, the very front end of the campaign if it gets funded. Um, and again, uh, building on the work that's been done by other communities who um, started with research into what's the perception that uh, the target market has of the community and 
and how do you address it? Um, there is uh, another um, organization that um, approached us, and that is uh, Pacific Seafoods, who own Euculet Harbor Seafoods. They're having a very difficult time attracting workers, uh, and um, they have told me that they could fill, if they had the labor, there are 100 jobs that are available in the community. And they're having trouble attracting people to uh, live in Euculet because of the high cost of housing there. And they've asked if we would partner in a campaign with them that would uh, bring people to live in Port Alberni with a guarantee of a job at uh, Euculet Harbor Seafoods or either of two plants that they have there. And um, it's something that we're uh, considering. We'll have more discussions with them as we move forward. They did provide a letter of support uh, for this particular grant application based on that uh, kind of premise. And um, uh, we'll, you know, we'll see how it's received. Yeah, the, the only other point I, I'd make, just because the numbers are fresh in my head because I wrote, read the reports today, but the local health authority um, reports from a couple years ago uh, mentioned that, you know, our, our demographics are very much, you know, like you said, they're aging. Um, in, uh, in 2026, we're going to go from 22% of people in the valley being over 65 to 30% of people being over 65, and most of those being over 75. Um, so while you know we have to be able to track the workers that uh, um, you know that are going to be able to fill those jobs uh, i don't think there's anything wrong with uh, building the community to be able to attract you know the seniors and and people who are retiring out of the workforce so that they stay in our community mm -hmm. um, and be able to enjoy the community too so uh, retirees is one of the uh uh, target markets. We are not placing as much emphasis uh, on them simply because they're finding Port Alberni uh, in and of their own accord. Um, I've mentioned to Council before that I've subscribed to the Welcome Wagon, uh, which uh, invites uh, new residents of the community to fill out a survey about how they found Port Alberni, why they came here, uh, indicate broadly the age group uh, that they're in and what has attracted to them uh, to the community. And the greatest proportion of the responses that we're getting are from uh, retirees and early retirees. So, um, I, I mean, we won't ignore uh, that uh, target market, I think we're ideally positioned. It's, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not as focused on that group because they're finding us uh, themselves. Okay, on the motion then, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Deacon. Uh, from the Chief Administrative Officer, uh, <coughs> Clock Tower Refurbishment Project, uh, partnering opportunity. Uh, just let you introduce that, uh, CO. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council's consideration is required of a proposed memorandum of understanding between the City and Sashot First Nation on the refurbishment, refurbishment of the City's Clock Tower. Council will recall that we um, communicated publicly on this last week that um, this issue would be before Council. Um, and, uh, and here it is. So we've been working with Sashat for a while. Council will, under, will recall that in 2017, $100,000 was set aside in the capital budget to uh, refurbish the clock tower from the effects of age and weather. And um, there's been comments in the community around why hasn't it been undertaken yet. And that's because we've been partnering and working on a partnership that has taken some time. And what we have now is, for your consideration, is a memorandum of understanding that would see the, the clock tower refurbished um, and have uh, receive addition of Sishot art and uh, cultural and historical signage. 
So um, the art has not been designed yet. The, the concept is that it would, it would reflect um, Sashat art, um, likely reflecting um, the wolf, which is culturally significant for Sashat in that area. And there'd be some kind of signage, uh, maybe at the landings of the clock tower, um, that would tell a story, a historical story. And um, so staff's been working with Sashat on this. Um, at this point, we're ready for council's input on whether you want to proceed with this or not. Um, best, I think, Mr. Mayor, if council um, asks questions that I can respond to. Sorry, let's get the motion out first. So, Councilor Minions, are you able to make that motion, please? That Council for the City of Port Alberni authorize the Mayor and Clerk to sign the Memorandum of Understanding with the Sashat First Nation, representing an agreement in principle to pursue a partnership that involves, as part of the refurbishment of the Harbour Key Clock Tower, the development of an art piece for the Clock Tower in accordance with terms generally as outlined. Sir, so seconder? Second, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, Councilor McClellan? Yeah, I guess. Uh, I think this is a great idea, though I've got some, some, a few questions. There's a statement in here that neither the city nor the Sashat will be required to provide funding for the project beyond the $100,000 already allocated in the city's financial plan. Has this been studied? Like I, I see a lot of the things, and oopsie, we need more money. If, if we oopsie need more money, what happens? And have, have we done any type of costing on the thing to know that this is going to work? Uh, CEO? Mr. Mayor, the budget estimate in 2017 was based on, um, on uh, input from an engineering firm, and I've talked to the engineering firm as recently as seven to eight weeks ago, and they tell me that that budget figure is still valid for this, for this project. Um, could we use more money? Absolutely we could, and the project would be better and uh, more of an impact if we have more money. But both parties agree that this should not cost um, the city taxpayers money, and it shouldn't cost the shop money. So we both committed that we'll work within this budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, McClemon, you had one more clarification. Yeah, um, so this $100,000 is all for structural, or is that also paying for some of the uh, art and sign work? The, um, the, the budget, um, the engineer tells us he thinks that uh, um, the structural component will cost in the neighborhood of $75,000. And we originally budgeted $100,000 with the intent that there would be some kind of improvement to the clock tower rather than just spend, um, do it, undertake a capital project, be left a little bit of room in there for council to have the ability to improve the, the clock tower. And uh, that is the room in that budget that the artwork will take up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sovey? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, pretty much it's just a, a comment. I just, I'm really hoping we're gonna move forward on this and actually getting the clock tower fixed. We've been working on this for quite a while. But I just want to ex extend my appreciation uh, to yourself and staff uh, that we actually uh, did the right thing. We all protect our history and our heritage in our community, and the clock tower has been there for quite a while. And uh, the fact that we reached out to the Duncan family, uh, I truly appreciate that, and, uh, and they'll stay in our thoughts. Uh, one question I do have, and I know I spoke to you uh, privately on this matter, but I want to bring it out in the public, is that the plaque that's there for the dedication of the clock tower will remain there, is it not? That's correct. There is there's absolutely no intention to remove the plaque that commemorates the donation from the estate of Fred Duncan. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Minions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm really excited about this project moving forward. Um, but I can't help but feel also like we're proceeding in a bit of a way that is contrary to the work we're doing with reconciliation. Um, this is a really positive project for our relationship with Sashat, but I know that not everybody in the Hoopachessic community feels the same way. Um, and I think that we have an opportunity in the future when we move forward with projects like this to learn from this experience. I think that we need to start engaging both First Nations earlier on in our planning process so that we're not coming to a point where we've planned the project, um, we're ready to move forward on it, and then we're reaching out and asking for or telling the other First Nation that we're moving forward. Um, I'm not intending to blame anyone for you know how we move for moved forward with this because I was just as much a part as anyone else of the planning of this. Um, 
but now that it's in the public and hearing some of how Hoopajesset community members are feeling, um, I think it's an opportunity for us to learn and maybe move forward in a different way on another project in the future. So I certainly don't think we should backtrack, um, but just remember this going forward, that I think it's a process that we need to improve. Okay, CAO. Mr. Mayor, um, point taken. Uh, we, we live in a, in a world where there are two First Nations who um, have rights and title claims to the land that the city is on. And we respect those rights and title claims at the start of every meeting of the city. That uh, We recognize that. And it's not, um, those rights and title claims are laid against the provincial and federal government, not the city. And we are going forward trying to maintain and improve relationships with both First Nations um, together at the same table on the Reconciliation Committee and separately when we meet with them individually. Um, as you all know, it's a challenge sometimes to move forward with one relationship if it, it might impact negatively the other one. And we've worked very carefully um, to, to not um, offend one nation by working with the other. And um, I think that in this in this difficult situation, the right solution is not to stand still. The right solution is to take uh, um, our best step and and keep taking steps. And if we misstep, then we're going to atone for that, apologize and fix it, and keep stepping. I don't think we should be standing still. Um, reconciliation is a step forward in a different direction, and, and I'm quite I'm quite proud of the fact that um, we've been able to reach this point with with a First Nations shot, which we who, with whom we do not have a relationship like this. So um, I, th I think it's, in my opinion, it's a great step. It's going to have some, um, possibly some repercussions in the community, but if we're well-intentioned, I think people will overlook our, our mistakes. And for uh, Council's information, we have actually uh, had some discussions with the Hupachasit leadership about this and have for quite some time. Uh, so it's not that we've left them out of any, uh, any information on this. Uh, Councillor Alamani, you had a question? Uh, just a comment, really, and, and a bit of a question. Um, I'm glad Councillor Minions brought up uh, that point, and I think it's very important. I think it's it's fantastic that we've we've uh, uh, come to the this point with the memorandum of understanding. I, I fully support it. Uh, my concern is uh, a little bit on Councillor McClemens' point around, you know, if we have a, a set budget of a hundred thousand dollars and about seventy-five thousand uh, dollars of that is going to go into the uh, the sort of technical um, uh, refurbishment of the of the tower, um, I do worry that you know the, the the portion for the cultural, the really meaningful portion uh, for our relationship with Seashot might get squeezed um, if that that operational sort of uh, um, tower portion uh, gets out of hand. So you know, I think it's just really important to, to be open in the process, and uh, um, as long as uh, as both. Parties are, are aware of, of kind of how things are going as they go. Um, I don't think it'll be a problem. I think it'll be a very positive thing for the community. Okay, and last word to Councillor uh, Washington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, a word from those at home. Um, they're just wondering if the clock tower will actually have a clock in it by the time the project is done. <laughs> or will it be like the Orange Bridge and be a tower with no clock, be the clock tower? Uh, CAO, any comment on that? Uh, I guess the short answer is we don't know. So we've asked the shot to come up with the artistic design, and if uh, and we've said that um, if they need to put art where the clock is, or somehow if the if the clocks um, are, are not um, compatible with the art, then they should tell us that, and and that that is in play. So uh, there's been no decision around whether there be clocks there or not, and in the end, it'll be a decision of council. Okay, on the motion, then all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And from the acting fire chief, uh, wildfire protection. Welcome, chief. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, when I first got here, we uh, put this motion forward and it had been brought before, but it, it, it hasn't. And I, I'm looking for clarification on this so that um, we have this ability if council chooses to to approve this to to be able to do it um, I guess with that said we did go outside the boundaries this year uh, and under the bylaw I feel I've got that authority to do it um, at the best interest um, and again always making sure that uh, the safety of the community is first and foremost um, with any type of response that we have so um, if you have any questions 
Regarding this, um, please, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, uh, Councillor Sovey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a few things that I just had questions about, and especially when the, it, come, it came out that there were actually got a request from the uh, Department of Wildlife to assist in, in these fires and all that, and using our, our personnel and using our equipment that I know it's very rough terrain, and I, I tend to worry about our assets as our nice trucks and everything in, in that area. So that, that's one, one concern I had. The other concern I had is that are we actually spreading ourselves thin with the staff that we do have and are committed to protecting our community. Uh, I do agree that uh, we assist with the, the Ministry of uh, BC Wildlife and so forth, but I just want to make sure that what we have, because it's a long-term project, and, and I know I had this experience through the police when we had major events and all that. We were using uh, on uh, overtime and people that are days off to uh, to plumage the request from uh, BC Wildlife. But, you know, sooner or later, everybody gets tired and we're not able to replace. And what are we leaving in our community in case something does happen? So are we running ourselves thin or? So uh, the, fir the first question in, in regards to the suitability of the equipment and, and what we're using and how we're managing that. The first thing that we've done uh, is we're using our reserve engine, the old engine one, uh, at this point in time. Uh, and I also um, used, utilized the, uh, the chief's pickup, so uh, unit 19. So it would go ahead and scout out the road and make sure that the roads were safe uh, and able to handle uh, and engine one would be able to go on that rope, that particular area, and, and do that scouting. And we did let uh, Ministry of uh, the Wildfire Branch know that um, we were uh, likely subject to be just on logging roads and not going up branch lines if, if not suitable. So so making sure that our, and our crews are very well aware of the limitations of, of our equipment. So um, we certainly don't want to lose a, a piece of equipment in response to a wildfire. So that, I guess that's the first part of the, que the first question. Second question, um, what we did do this past weekend is work with the, the Valley Fire Chiefs um, to come up with a coordinated plan of resource allocation for manpower and for, for equipment. And so we were in close contact with, with the other Valley Departments to ensure that we all maintained a level of, of manpower. And I, and I recognize that we are um, uh, a small department and we have summer holidays and we have crew away, um, uh, but the crew was also um, quite happy to go out at this point and and provide help provide that service and one of the ways that we that we ensured that there was uh, some protection outside and and we could help BC wildfire service was with uh, providing a, a higher level of response to calls within the valley um, uh, as an example we were using uh, uh, our automatic mutual aid uh, for smoking structure and for bush or grass fire for Sprout Lake and Beaver Creek and then ultimately for Cherry Creek. So we would respond with our crew in, um, in a timely manner to assist them with their duty crew that they had on as well. So And to be uh, clear that all coordinations of how the attacks are, are being done or how you approach your fires, all the calls are being made by BC Wildlife. Uh, BC Wildfire Service is the one that, that, that uh, asked for the assistance. So initially, I guess if I can say on the, on the Beaufort fire, um, they had asked uh, for a, a water tender and, and a crew of 10 men. And, and that was put out to us. And of course, we, are, we don't have a water tender as a Port Alberni Fire Department. And I certainly could not put 10 men on a wildfire uh, out, out, outside the city limits. So um, we were not able to assist at that point in time. Uh, but in talking with uh, the other Valley Fire Departments, um, the offer was made that, you know, if you're able to go out and provide those services, you know, we'll certainly help help with them in any way that we can. Thank you. Councilor McClemon. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'd like to make the motion that the Council of the City of Port Alberni authorize the Port Alberni Fire Department to respond outside its fire protection district under authority of the BC Wildfire Service to suppress or assist in suppression of a wildfire in the region where in the opinion of the fire chief, such response is in the best interest of the community. And I have a second I'd like to comment. Second, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I think that this is uh, kind of what we did at the regional district, but retroactive to uh, give permission for the, for the fire department to go out. And I'm not too worried if our fancy fire trucks get a scratch on them. 
uh, I think it's more important that uh, the town and the valley gets protected. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not overly concerned with that. I realize we don't have a tanker truck, and uh, you've been on two of the fires particularly that I go by the news, so I presume that's accurate. And so that's good, and probably the one's easier to get to, so thank you. Okay, seeing no further requests to speak on the motion, then all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Fire Thank Chief. you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council, there's a late item, uh, F12.1, uh, uh, temporary change to uh, liquor license. Uh, we have a, a Kingsway Hotel. Um, is it still the Kingsway Hotel? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, an intention to apply for a temporary change to the liquor license to extend their hours over the Salmon Festival weekend. Any clarification? Uh, yes, if you want to make the motion, that'd be great. The report from the City Clerk dated August 13th, we received. Council of the City of Port Alberta would provide no objection to the application of the Kingsway Hotel to the Liquor Control and License Branch for a temporary extension of their liquor service hours to 2 a.m. on Salmon Festival weekend, August 31st through September 3rd, 2018. Is there a seconder for that? Second, Mr. Mayor. Any and discussion? Just to note, Mr. Mayor, the Kingsway used to be open a lot longer hours, and the people from Solmass enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Sosovey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, right now, with my experience, with my career and all that, uh, the only time I remember as in getting special permission with New Year's Eve and so forth. I'm just worried what kind of president we're, we're setting out here and are we going to allow all the other uh, uh, local establishment uh, have the same privilege in that area to uh, open up a bit later. Um, concerns I have and I would like to see uh, to hear from the city clerk on this is I don't see usually we have consultation with the police as as how they feel. Because I, I feel that it would impact some of the services uh, if needed after hours. Because I know for myself, I would want to know myself if it's a certain bar is staying uh, out uh, later. So if I could hear from the city clerk, is it part that prior for, because I hate to say uh, approve it here, because obviously I would love to have people have the opportunity. You okay? Okay. It just I want to see if we have consultation with the police. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, I apologize for this one. This is a, a very late item that I was just aware of immediately before this meeting and thought it was important to bring forward to council. Um, so Helen Poon, the owner of the Kingsway, is applying for the temporary change. So typically when we have requests, um, we do go out and we, we gather input from the public, bring that to council. Those are typically for permanent change to liquor licenses and certainly in this case we don't have the opportunity um, timing wise to gather any input and um, the request has been made for the Friday night Saturday night Sunday night and Monday night of, of Salmon Festival weekend um, and councils essentially not approving it they're just going to state that they have no objection to it and um, the Kingsway will still be required to go through a process with liquor licensing and, and I'm not off the top of my head completely sure of what that process is. Okay thank you anything else council? Then on the motion all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, current status report uh, Council, any questions on the status report? Then, uh, Councillor Alamani, are you able to move receipt of that status report, please? I move that the current status report be received. Seconder? Second. Mr. Mayor, if yes. I might, um, Brian Mosley's in the room uh, representing Wolf Takama from um, Engineering and Works. If there's any questions about Engineering and Public Works, um, this will be a good time to ask him. Yeah, this would be perfect. Um, come on in, Brian, thank you so much. Um, Brian, there's a, thank you so much for your cruise finishing off the sidewalk on Johnson Road. I'm just, I notice in behind that there's a whole lot of uh, gravel and so on. Did you discover any issues related to that that uh, needed to be addressed with water or anything like that? We put a, what we call a curtain drain in there because there was water that was spilling over the sidewalk for years, just an abundance of water. So we put in a curtain drain and tied it into a catch basin 
further down. So that should take care of any of those issues where the water was pooling over the sidewalk. Okay, thank you. It looks good. Is it wider than normal or is that the standard width for? Uh, standard width. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Uh, sorry, Councillor McClellan. Yeah, if this is the place to bring it up, I was going to ask at the end and get a, try and get an answer later as uh, Mr. Takma is on vacation again. Um, my question uh, that I asked last time when, when we did have a report from the, uh, your department was on the Gertrude Street Bridge and, and uh, how, how the work is there. And um, what I would like to do know is since uh, September 29, 2009, when the report was, inspection was done by NCOM, have we had a further inspection since whatever work has been done and, and how much is to let us know what is left or what is finished or anything like that? Uh, I don't have any, anything to report on that for you now. On, on, well, I figured we you, you may else. not know is why I was going to ask no, at I the end yeah, of the I'm meeting sure. and give you till next, well, next meeting or sometime where you can yeah. email. Yeah, I can find out for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Minions? Thank you. Just because we've heard about it um, tonight, I'm not sure if you or if the CAO could give any update on the 6th Avenue project and if that's going into next year's plans now or what the status is. <clears throat> Maybe you could speak to the um, Coal Creek project, can, which will morph into six. I can tell you that the Coal Creek project is happening now, which is the, the main meat and potatoes of that project to get us separated up to 6th and Melrose. Um, and that's a continuation of the project from a few years ago going through the gully. So now we'll have separation up to 6th and Melrose. Uh, and that's where the, the end of that project will, will take us to. Uh, we still have the issue of going up six in separation. So uh, we're working on some plans of possibly just laying one pipe up Sixth Avenue up to Montrose rather than replacing everything, which was the original project. Uh, and that scope uh, with the cost that came in were you know, off the charts of what we had originally thought it was a few years ago. So we're still working on how far we can get uh, within that scope of money. Okay, so on behalf of council, uh, you know, congratulations to the crews. There's a, a lot of work that's happening over the summertime, uh, and you know, all of the projects when they're completed, they look really good. And I think it's something that uh, that the city sh should be proud of, and crews should be proud of uh, all of their work on it. It uh, will make a huge difference. So if you could pass that on for thank us, thank you. Please. I'll pass that on for sure. Okay, thank you. On the motion, then, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. And council, then that brings us to our manager's monthly reports. The first from Parks, Recreation and Heritage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you have my report in front of you there and, and two items I'd like to bring your attention to. Uh, first one, you notice Mr. Cranevelt uh, did not stay uh, long when he was introduced. Uh, was a function of he's participating in his 31st annual shutdown at the Aquatic Center. And so we're fortunate that he started when he was five years old and has, uh, has run 30 successful annual Aquatic Center shutdowns. So that uh, commenced today. And the other item I wanted to bring to your attention is the success of the Our Town event. So Jessica Gilchrist, our, our Town uh, coordinator, this is my first experience. Uh, with our towns and I can tell you there's not any other community our size uh, that I'm aware of that runs uh, those accessible family free events uh, is tremendous to see so I'm very very proud of of the work with the the staff at those events and I've seen most of you at events and I hope you'll you'll enjoy our our final event down at the Harbour Key later this month okay thank you anything else council questions then Councillor Paulus Paulson do you want to move for your I'd like to move that the monthly report from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage providing information about current departmental operations be received. Seconder? I'll second that. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. And then from Economic Development. <clears throat> Welcome Mr. Deacon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, councillors. Uh, my report essentially has two section, uh, sections. Uh, one reports on the grant submissions that I made in July and uh, details um, what the request 
uh, was for, what the contribution that would be required from the city, what um, problem uh, I'm proposing to address uh, with the application and the solution that's proposed in that. And the second section just talks about selected uh, additional work that was done in July. Be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. I'm happy to see that you're making applications to IC. Uh, sometimes that can be a, you know, a bit of a process to work through. So, thank you for doing that. Um, it's always good to to use their money instead of our our own. So, thank you. If we're successful, uh, we will. Uh, receive two and a half times what we're being asked or required to contribute uh, to the application. So the applications uh, total $191,000, uh, slightly in excess of that, and the contribution that's required from the city in cash is 74000 Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Minions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment at the bottom of your report, um, the other section, finalizing work in the CP BC and CPA pilot project sector development by data design, um, what this looks like. Um, and uh, I've heard a lot of reference to the sector development um, project or report or process that's going on, um, but haven't seen anything from it. So I'm wondering if there's a report we can see or if you're able to at some point provide a report so we can get a bit better idea of what's going on. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, just before uh, the council meeting today, I received uh, a draft of uh, the report. Um, so I will take a look at it. If I have any uh, concerns about it, I'll get them back to uh, the provincial government. Uh, and then if, if I don't have any concerns, that report uh, will be brought, brought forward to council at the next meeting. And essentially uh, what the project is, uh, the province was uh, looking for a community to partner with on a new approach to uh, economic development. And it was... Uh, they were very aware of uh, the fact that I was uh, working in 13 sectors of the economy and trying to bring that down to a manageable uh, number. Uh, so um, our, my colleague in the provincial government uh, stuck up um, our hand and said Port Alberni would be happy to partner with you on that. Uh, so we've been going through uh, essentially an 18 month uh, process where we've been taking a look at uh, employment figures, uh, employment revenues, and business uh, revenues from every sector of the economy. And we've been comparing that uh, to provincial averages in, uh, in those sectors of the economy in an effort to select the five or six sectors of the economy that we should, uh, that represent the lowest hanging fruit, if you will those portions of the economy that are already moving uh, and um, have higher growth rates than other sectors of the economy. So the report that we'll get uh, will simply say, here are the six or seven sectors of the economy that we think you should concentrate on in efforts to build uh, a cluster of work uh, around those sectors. And um, uh, we, 
the reason that the project has taken the 18 months is because they uh, needed to wait for data that was coming out of the 2016 census. Uh, so data that isn't uh, available at the front end of the report. Uh, and the reason that you haven't seen anything other than a reference uh, to this point in time is uh, a combination of factors. Uh, the first one being that it was a pilot project and the province was very sensitive to what may or may not result from it. Uh, the second uh, factor was that the provincial government changed in the midst of the project. And uh, they weren't certain that they were going to have uh, the support of the new government uh, to continue working with it. And also the lead agency got moved from the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism and Training uh, into uh, Forest Lands, Natural Resources, Operations and Rural Development. And uh, so, I was being asked to keep uh, the work uh, confidential until they felt comfortable that um, they'd addressed all of the, um, I think, uh, political and data uh, sensitivities that uh, were involved in it. Partway through uh, the process, I let them know uh, that um, we were informally working with the city of Quinell because I'd uh, had some conversations with them and thought that some of the challenges that they were facing were similar to the challenges that we had. And so they extended the pilot project to Quinell and that represented another uh, kind of delay, if you will, because they wanted to make sure that the approaches that were being taken in both communities were um, relatively similar and where there were differences in approaches that um, they would be able to account for them in the results. So that's the project and you'll have a report available to you at the next council meeting. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that, um, because I know that the dry dock project has been um, supported, that that's one of the areas, as I understand, um, that we're looking to develop. Um, I've had a lot of questions about the dry dock. If the city of Port Alberni is looking to have an ownership role in that, um, or if we're just supporting the study um, th for, as an economic development initiative. So. Uh, uh, my intention in uh, providing support uh, for that was just uh, support for an economic development initiative in a sector that I knew had been um, uh, identified as one of the key sectors that uh, we should be working in and that had uh, been identified uh, in two census uh, reports. Uh, the RFP does ask the consultants to recommend the best ownership uh, structure for uh, the project and um, I, um, I think it's really highly unlikely that they would come back and uh, recommend that the municipality have uh, an ownership role in it. Uh, I do know that uh, Canadian uh, Maritime Engineering is looking to have an ownership role uh, in it and we think uh, commensurate with uh, the amount that they're willing to invest uh, the project, the initial research that had been done on it said 
that it was probably a $48 million project. They were prepared to put up 12. So when we were making the request of the provincial government to uh, assist in the work on it, um, we did indicate to them that um, the ownership would likely be a uh, commensurate with the amount that was uh, invested in the capital uh, project. Um, I think, you know, it will come down to either the Port Authority uh, um, owning it um, or uh, CME or some uh, combination. Um, and again, uh, we've asked in the, uh, that the uh, study do take a look at the best practices for um, owning and operating a floating, floating dry dock. Uh, Councillor Washington, are you able to move receipt of this report, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the monthly report from the Economic Development Manager providing information about current departmental operations be received. Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Carried. Thank you. And from the RCMP, Inspector Hunter, welcome. Thank you, Worship Council. I'm here to present the quarterly report for uh, policing activities uh, for the second quarter of the year, which is uh, April, May, and June. We uh, received 3,050 calls for service during this period. 2,574 of those were within the municipality of Port Alberni. Uh, criminal offenses uh, for the quarter are up 16%, uh, largely driven by property crime, uh, which is uh, up from 340 to 342 compared to 262 last year, and that's 31%. Uh, uh, I can tell you, <coughs> I did the year-to-date uh, numbers for uh, crime. Uh, total criminal code offenses year to date compared to 2017 are up 29% and property crime is up 45%. Uh, I can tell you um, the community does continue to have an issue with recidivism. Uh, the community does uh, have uh, uh, a lot of our clients who are drug addicted with mental health issues and poverty and uh, they're, they're feeding the drug addictions by stealing property. And um, I'll go through some numbers here. Just real quickly, um, <clears throat> just the general uh, numbers. Uh, total calls for service uh, went from 2,257 to 2,574. Uh, violent crime uh, remained the same at uh, 79. I, I will tell you, uh, the um, Stats Canada just released their crime severity index numbers at the end of the July for 2017. These are the numbers that McLean Magazine grabs a hold of and, you know, the most violent place to live, those types of things. So uh, last year, uh, out of 307 municipalities with a population over 10,000, uh, Port Alberni was ranked 10th uh, for 2016, and in uh, 2017, uh, they're ranked at uh, 15. So um, that's nothing to be raising our pom-poms in the air about. We're still ranked very high at a 307 uh, municipalities uh, in the country. Um, property crime uh, went from 262 to 342. Other criminal code, and those are your uh, breaches, uh, generally speaking, cause disturbances from 173 to 183. Uh, drug offenses from 36 down to 32 bring our total criminal code from 550 to 636. I'm just uh, in the breakdowns here. I'm just going to go through some of the property crimes uh, driving uh, this. So you can see that our break and enters uh, to uh, business and residents are actually down. Our break and enter other, and that's the, the sheds, uh, those types of uh, things into yards. Uh, the last quarter, you may or may not recall that they uh, had skyrocketed. 
and uh, there was an arrest in the community of an individual that likely is responsible for 95% of those and likely 95% of those uh, 11 that you see there. Uh, the media has done a good job of reporting on these uh, uh, chronic offenders uh, that receive their, their sentence and are back in the community real quick. Uh, of the two that were spoken to, uh, the two in the media there not long ago, uh, upon their release, they were arrested within days. Uh, certainly, a, uh, arrest warrants the next day after release for uh, committing further crimes. Um, so it can get a little bit uh, frustrating. Uh, you'll see thefts from 47 up to 59, shoplifting from 20 up to 47. Uh, one of those uh, offenders, Colin Affleck, uh, you've read lots about him in the media, uh, admitted to uh, uh, many, many, many shopliftings. And uh, um, I'm here to tell you that uh, those are the ones that he was convicted on, and there's many, many more. Uh, theft from vehicle from 28 uh, to 35. And that's all I'm going to talk about of, of those numbers. You guys have your report there. The rest of the numbers are fairly consistent. But I do want to just talk real, real briefly. There, there has been discussion uh, in the community. Um, last time I spoke here about some chronic offenders that uh, um, my request to the courts is upon the release to have a condition of no-go Port Alberni. And, and I have heard comments out there, well, how can you do that? They need a place to live. Um, and, and I agree. And the clients that I'm referring this recommendation to the courts are people that are not from Port Alberni. They don't have a residence here. They have no family here. They don't have a job here. They come here to continue that type of lifestyle. Um, we expel a lot of resources in this community for our own folks that need help. They need lots of help and uh, ultimately that's what we want to do with these folks. So. I want to give the community an example of the type of people that I'm talking about that are not welcome in my community if they continue their criminal behavior. And I've got to be clear on that. If they continue their criminal behavior and don't abide by their conditions. There's three adult male individuals that moved into your community in the last several weeks that, uh, and I've, uh, capitulated some statistics here for the last 10 years. Um, and these individuals are not from here. They have no family here. They have no reason to be here. They came here for opportunities to continue their criminal ways. Male number one uh, has uh, a total of 209 police contacts and has amassed 99 criminal convictions uh, since 2007, including robbery, sex assault, sexual interference, extortion, flight from police, possession of weapons, assault causing bodily harm, break and enter, theft of motor vehicle, many, many property crimes, theft, possession of stolen property, etc. Male number two, 342 police contacts, and he has amassed 99 charges as well. Trafficking, drugs, CDSA, theft, possession of stolen property, break and enter, assaults, assault causing bodily harm, weapons possessions, uh, multiple uh, property crime offenses, and male three, 353 police contacts, 36 uh, charges, including assaults, b &E, thefts, these type of things. So that's a total of 904 police contacts and 234 charges for these three individuals that moved to your community here, my community, uh, within the last uh, three weeks. And I have, they're all on conditions, and I have to stress here, uh, if they want to come here and be uh, law-abiding contributors to our community, I'm all for that. Absolutely. But if they are here to continue the, their criminal behavior, they're not welcome here. And that's why these types of clients, I ask the courts to impose no-go Port Alberni. You're not to be here. And I will tell you, we're receiving people here that are on no-goes in their current community. And it's one of these revolving things that, that are happening. So I just say that for your awareness. That's the back story of why I ask for uh, no-go Port Alberni to these types of clients. And uh, they're not welcome here. And don't just end that quote, media. They're not welcome here if they continue their criminal behavior and don't abide by their conditions. That's it. Uh, thank you, Inspector Hunter. Just a quick question. Are you alerted? Is RCMP alerted beforehand when these um, 
people are headed our way? So that's, that's how we find out, generally speaking. Sometimes we make an arrest and we find out uh, without having previously known. Uh, so the associate probation officer or parole officer in another community alerts us, by the way, John Doe is coming to your community and here's what you have to look forward to. Uh, if your thefts go up or your robberies go up, uh, please have a look at this individual because they're on their way. So generally speaking, Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, we do get alerted to these and obviously we share that with all of the membership and, and our partners out there in the community as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Paulson and then Councillor Sove. Just a quick question on, on the theft part of things. Um, doesn't matter if it's break into a house or shoplifting or whatever. Downstream, um, are we aware of the people that are actually buying this stuff and moving it further down the chain? And um, I mean, that for, for me, if there's no market for them to get rid of this stuff, that's part of the problem too. So yes, we are we are aware of some of them, not all of them, and we have uh, projects out there uh, surveilling these. We've had charges of possession of stolen property, and. Um, uh, there are a few in this community that take advantage of the vulnerable sure. people that will steal that $800 bicycle and, and sell it for 50 bucks, yeah. for sure. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sobey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just two questions. Uh, number one, and if you're unable to answer, uh, that's fine, but if next time you come for the report, if you give us a bit of a, uh image as how we are doing with... Uh, alcohol-related uh, criminal offenses and so forth, uh, impaired driving, is, is alcohol actually being a, an attribute to many of these crimes? I understand about the drug addiction for property crimes and so forth, but uh, I just want to see what kind of, of what alcohol uh, is affecting. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I can, sp I, I can speak to that because the question has been asked before and I, I run the numbers and it's consistent around 35% of our criminal code offenses have drugs or alcohol related uh, to that. Um, the uh, the um, criminal code traffic offenses uh, you will see here went from 36 to 65 in the quarter. Those are impaired drivers. The bulk of those are impaired drivers. And um, it's... Uh, those are self-generated files by our members, and we have a core group of members here uh, that uh, are very assertive uh, in uh, ensuring we have safe roads, and those numbers are going to uh, keep going up, and that's what those numbers are. But uh, it'll quarter after quarter after month, it'll be about 35%. Okay. And my second question and final question would be, can you explain uh, the process tonight as you witness we extended some hours of operations for a liquor establishment and so forth and number one if you have any concerns and number two does the liquor board actually before them approving check with you and consult with you mr. mayor anytime there is a, a request uh, for an extension either on a permanent basis or otherwise the consultative process uh, like the city clerk uh, described does happen and we're certainly engaged in that and our position on these is, uh, is it a problem establishment? Um, most of our establish establishments aren't. Uh, they take their business very seriously. And uh, we don't uh, take a, a position either way on the extension of the hours. Now, if you're getting into 3, 4 in the morning, I have a big problem with that. And the reason being is uh, the issues start happening in the later hours. That's when people's decision-making abilities tend to uh, deter and de deteriorate a little bit and it's an opportunity to sell more liquor because everyone's buying rounds at the end and that type of thing and that's where you get the inebriation happening and obviously uh, some calls uh, for service would increase in that regard but if an establishment is uh, properly run uh, we uh, generally don't take a, an issue with it but if it's not properly run we'll be front and center identifying that as a concern but your main one thing for sure you want to be part of the process into approving these extended hours or not yeah and we are we are part of the process for sure okay thank you uh councillor sobey do you want to move receipt of that report then, please yes mr mayor let me get back to here <coughs> i'll move 
that we accept the departmental operations from the RCMP from the report. I'll move for receive. Is there a seconder? Okay, all those in favor? Carried. Uh, and if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, just one final comment. Uh, a good portion of the summer ha has occurred with lots of events in our community, a lot of events. And, and I got to say, uh, I said this last uh, report, I'll say it here again, these events are well run. Uh, these folks are taking this stuff very seriously. Uh, I do site visits on a lot of these, uh, the five acre shaker, certainly I did a site visit there. Um, the Thunder in the Valley was this weekend. So from a policing perspective, uh, of those two events this weekend, we only received one call for service. Uh, there was uh, a, a fight between a couple of individuals and sometimes when you have a bit too much to drink and you disagree about the Toronto Blue Jays or something, you end up into a fight. Um, I'm not saying that's what it was, but these things happen. But generally speaking, and the events uh, previous uh, that led uh, up to this date have all been so well run. Uh, you guys need to be proud of your community and these folks take it seriously. Because I will tell you, uh, if there are issues, uh, good luck in having your event the next year because uh, I will not be supportive and I have a pretty strong word. So um, the events are well run and I just want you guys to know that. Okay, thank you very much. Council, that brings us to item G, bylaws. Uh, first bylaw, City of Port Alberni Nuisance Abatement. Uh, Councillor McClellan, are you able to make that motion, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor, the City of Port Alberni Nuisance Abatement Bylaw 2018, Amendment Number 1, Bylaw Number 4969, being now finally adopted, signed by the Mayor and Clerk, sealed the corporate seal, number 4969. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And uh, the permissive tax exemption bylaw 2019, bylaw number 4970. Councillor Minions, are you able to make those motions, please? That permissive tax exemption bylaw 2019, bylaw number 4970, be now introduced and read a first time. Second, Mr. All those in favor? Carried. That permissive tax exemption bylaw 2019, bylaw number 4970, be read a second time. Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. That permissive tax exemption bylaw 2019, bylaw number 4970, be run a third time. Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. And from the Director of Development Services, um, I'm sorry, City Clerk, no, Director of Development Services, looking at the wrong part of my machine here. Uh, zoning bylaw text amendment number T11, uh, site specific use C3. Service commercial. Uh, Councillor Sobe, are you able to make this motion, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That the report dated August 7, 2018, from the Director of Development Services be received. Is there a seconder? Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. That the zoning bylaw text amendment number T11, site specific use C3 service commercial. Bylaw number 4930 be now finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with the corporate seal and numbered 4930. Seconder. Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Opposed? Comment. Comment. Yeah, th this bill and I, when, when this came up first, I supported it. And in fact, again, there was one councillor that didn't only. But I, I've been watching that building for quite some time and, and really the the uh, concerns raised at that time by Councillor Polson seemed to be quite valid. If people having the access into that back alley, it seems like a, a, a treacherous spot. And uh, I now have some concerns with it, so I do not wish to support that. Okay. Motion still carried. Thank you very much, Council. As wrong as it was. <laughs> okay. Uh, Council, now we're on to uh, correspondence for action. Uh, first one is for the Albany District Fall Fair Association. We have a letter requesting permission to close city streets. Uh, Councilor Washington, are you able to make that motion, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the letter dated July 25, 2018, requesting to close city streets from the corner of Bird Street along 10th Avenue to Hollywood Street from 11 a.m to the conclusion of the parade on Saturday, September 8, 2018, be received, and Council concur, concur with the request subject to city-stated road closure conditions. I'll second that motion, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? 
Carried. And from the Port Alberni Port Authority, we have an email dated July 26th requesting permission to close Harbor Road from uh, Friday, August 31st uh, to Monday, September 3rd. Uh, Councillor Minions, are you able to make that motion, please? That the email dated July 26, 2018, requesting to close Harbor Road from Friday, August 31st, 2018 at 12 p.m. to Monday, September 3rd at 6 p.m. for the Salmon Festival at Taiyi Landing be received and Council concur with the request subject to the City's stated road closure condition. Is there a seconder? Second, Mr. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And from Jacqueline Wynn and David Gilbert, we have a letter dated July 30th regarding ongoing problems with encampments in Dry Creek Park and the fire risk uh, associated with these encampments that they pose to the City of Port Alberni. Um, Count CAO, are you able to address this, please? Mr. Mayor, I can tell you that um, we responded to the letter writers um, to an earlier email on a similar topic and uh, inform them that our parks crew um, are in that park and other parks on a re regular basis cleaning up debris. Um, there there uh, are likely people living there this time of year. Um, I was in, in Dry Creek on Friday. I walked through with the manager of bylaw services and we walked um, from stem to stern and checked out some of the usual spots. We think there's at least one person living there right now in, on a semi-permanent basis. and. Um, to um, remove a person like that is a bit of a coordinated process. It requires the RCMP to take that person into custody while we coordinate our parts crew removing all of their, um, their material, basically. And then that person is, is released after processing and will likely continue to live there, but will have less um, material built up in the park. So there's, there's some people who we deal with on a rotating basis like that. Uh, I don't have a quick answer for you. I can tell you that, that several, several of our departments are working together and independently on these challenges. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sobe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, are we making any attempts through the RCMP that we're dealing with the uh, Ministry of Social Services to assist these people? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm not sure uh, specifically through the RCMP, but um, the social services are represented on our um, nuisance building working group and, and our enforcement staff have a close working relationship. So when we come across somebody in need, we do report um, them or, or um, inform social services about that person or mental health as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Silver, are you able to make that motion with this? Thank please? you, Ms. Mayor. The, uh, the letter dated July 30th, 2018 regarding ongoing problems with encampments in Dry Creek Park and the first uh, and the fire risks, these encampments to the City of Port Alberni be received with thanks. Okay. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. And Council, from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, we have a, a letter dated July 23rd advising the City of Port Alberni <laughs> that uh, we have not complied with community charter legislation requiring financial information and be submitted by May 15th each year. Uh, Council, uh, just to a uh, little bit of an opening to this, let you know this situation is extremely concerning to me. Uh, Council was not made aware that the city had not met its statutory financial reporting obligations and we did not know that the province had written letters addressed to mayor and council about this issue. Uh, the first time that I saw the letter from the province of July 23rd was when I read it in the agenda package for this meeting. Council has worked hard to ensure that we improve financial budgeting and reporting for the citizens of our city. But in addition, cities are also required to report to the provincial government. While the city has met its reporting de deadlines in prior years, I was dismayed to learn about the delay this year. I would like Council to be provided with a detailed plan about how the City's financial officer is going to bring the City into compliance with our statutory obligations and what steps will be taken to ensure this does not happen in future years. I appreciate that the Director of Finance prepared a brief memo to Council on this important issue, but in my view, it doesn't provide nearly enough information. And I'm not prepared to accept it until Council is provided with the information that we need. Um, Putting this out for Council, any comments, Council, on where we're at with this letter from the province? 
Uh, Councilor Minions. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the CAO could comment on the staffing challenges that we've had in that department um, that led to the challenges that we've had. Mr. Mayor, um, as you've noted, there's a letter from the province saying that we missed our statutory obligation to um, provide audited financial statements for the previous year. Um, that deadline was May 15th, I believe, um, and uh, the city has missed that and received a letter from the province asking for us to um, essentially do what you just asked, um, to inform them of what the steps, inform them of when we'll have those, those documents to them and what steps will we be taking to, um, to ensure that doesn't happen again. So attached to that report in your agenda is a response letter to the province as well as a report from the Director of Finance. But in the response letter to the province, um, the, um, uh, the city has um, told the province that we fully expect to submit the audited financial statements to the inspector of municipalities immediately following the September 24th regular meeting of council. Um, and that the city is currently undergoing recruitment processes to fill key positions with the, within the finance department. Uh, moving forward, fully staffed, that we anticipate not seeing a problem like this in the future, and as we haven't had in the past. Also, Mr. Mayor, in response to some questions from yourself this morning, um, we've prepared a, a late item report um, with responses to those questions, and um, some of what you're asking for is in that report. Would you like me to summarize that now? Go ahead. Davina, maybe you can share that. Are you able to? No? So um, I'll read the questions and I'll summarize the answers. Uh, question one, at what point did the financial officer know that the May 15th deadline was not going to be met? Um, so I'll read you the long answer because I'm not, not able to project that. Um, when the deputy the director of finance, when the deputy director of finance announced retirement plans in early January, in early January, steps were taken to provide coverage using existing staff. At that point in time, the director was aware that missing the statutory deadline was a risk, but not an expectation. During early 2018, uh, the city experienced a second retirement in the finance department, followed by a full-time employee stepping back from a full-time position to part-time. Those impacts were absorbed internally. Uh, in early April, um, when the city's accountant, which is a, a senior um, unionized finance department um, position, um, when that position became vacant due to long-term sick leave, the director realized that at that point um, we were not going to meet the, the uh, statutory deadline. Question two, why was council not informed until now that the statutory obligation was not met? And my response to that is that at the April 23rd in-camera meeting uh, of council, the CAO updated council on current personnel limitations which were affecting workloads and timelines. Um, regardless of what was discussed in that meeting or other, other discussions, um, it was an oversight on my part and on the part of the Director of Finance not to inform Council in a public meeting that that had occurred, that we were going to um, miss that deadline. The next question was the Audit Committee made aware of the delay, if not why, um, and the Audit Committee was not informed and there was an opportunity to provide that information to the Audit Committee at the May 28th Audit Committee meeting and um, as similar to the previous answer, that was an oversight both on my part and on the Director of Finance's part. Sorry. Question four, uh, who was the letter of June 20th addressed to and when was it delivered? So the, the letter on, received July 23rd from the province referenced an earlier June 20th letter. And that June 20th letter um, referred to in that letter was addressed and delivered to the Director of Finance. And we've attached to the late item a copy of that letter. Um, question five, what response did city staff make to the June 20th notice of being in violation? If the city responded in writing, please provide a copy of that correspondence. So in response, the Director of Finance is in regular contact with Ministry staff. In response to the June 20th letter from the province, the Director of Finance communicated with Ministry staff verbally regarding the status of the audited financial statements for 2017. The other two items referenced in the June 20th letter, namely the tax rates bylaw and the 2018 to 22 2022 five-year financial plan were adopted by council and submitted to the province by the legislative deadlines. So the, the director informed the province at that time that two of the three items noted as outstanding were in fact, um, we had met the deadline on. Question six, uh, when did it become obvious to the staff that the city would not comply with the deadline and what steps were taken to ex expedite completion of the tasks? So the first part was answered earlier uh, when it became uh, obvious to us. Um, as far as steps for mitigation, um, 
when the Deputy Director of Finance submitted notification of retirement, the City began our standard hiring process, which includes consulting with Council. The City's accountant, um, the senior unionized position I spoke of earlier, was appointed to act in the capacity of Dep Deputy Director in the interim, and that accountant um, role duties were shared among several other finance personnel. When the Acting Director of Finance, which was the accountant, fell ill, and the newly Deputy and the new Deputy Director of Finance, um, who we had hired but was not available for more than a month to us, um, it became obvious that we were not going to be, have enough resources to, to meet all tasks, and we suspended work on all but the most critical tasks, focusing on priorities. The Director of Finance has completed much of the preparation for the audit on her own, while also performing critical tasks for the Deputy Director position and the Accountant position. Uh, the city's auditors are scheduled to commence the audit the week of August 20th, and the province has been duly notified of expected timelines for completion. Okay, Council, any uh, comments? Uh, Councilor Paulson? Um, so, just getting timelines. June the 20th, um, we had a second uh, deadline place, which I believe was in Ju July, am I right there? July 23rd, so we've missed that particular deadline. So where are we at with actually meeting the, um, when do we anticipate actually having the information right to the province? We anticipate having um, audited financial statements in front of council at your September 24th meeting. And if, if you approve those, accept those, then they will be forwarded to the province the next day and we've informed Council of that. The auditor is scheduled for the second two weeks in August, and because of our meeting schedule, we're not able to get that done. Um, the auditor is scheduled for two weeks in August and one week in September, and that means we can't get to Council with those numbers until the second meeting in September, which unfortunately is the 24th, and the province is aware of that. Okay. Uh, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was brought up at our audit meeting today, so we left, we left a lot of the details for this meeting. But um, Director Rothwell did mention that there was no actual penalty for the late submission. And she mentioned something about grants. If you could just explain that to the people at home just so they know what's going on. Sure. The, the July 23rd letter from the province says um, that they, um, the province, until, they, until we, they receive our audited financial statements, they will not... Um, approve any bylaws submitted to them. So occasionally the city passes bylaws that need provincial authorization, um, and there are none before the province right now, so um, we don't expect any impact there. Um, they've also said they will not be forwarding to us any grants that, are, that are, we are due for. And so that, um, we think, will likely impact um, the timeliness of the next gas tax, tax payment. But we don't believe that there's anything that will impact um, the bottom line. So we won't lose any grants or lose any money or pay any penalty. But uh, those are administrative penalties that are meant to put pressure on us to meet the deadline. Okay. Uh, Councillor Sobe, then Councillor Minions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, yes, and thank you to Councillor Washington for explaining. This was uh, spoken about at the uh, audit committee. Uh, first of all, I just want to hand it to the CEO at least. You know, you step forward, uh, admitted there was a break in communication, and uh, what's mostly important right now is how we move forward and get this uh, rectified and uh, start getting the ball rolling for our operations, for our finance department. Uh, I, I do admit that uh, I recognize the, the restraints that you have of uh, staffing issues within the finance department, but let alone, again, it's uh, when it's important that we get certain things that we need to meet under Section 167 of the Community Charter that we have to report. Uh, we have to take the necessary t steps to getting these things done. So uh, thank you for all the answers to the questions uh, asked by the mayor and uh, looking forward to uh, coming to a solution and moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Minions. Thank you. Um, just maybe for some clarity around what does our um, the staffing composition of the finance department look like um, once those positions are full, filled or if they're filled now, are we at risk of you know a bunch of people retiring all at once again or do we think we, I mean I know we can't foresee everything but do you think we're in a safer position going forward? 
Yeah, um, we didn't anticipate these retirements, obviously. Um, we anticipated one retirement to finance uh, this year or next year or the year after, and our five-year plan um, anticipated a reduction from a full-time position to a half-time position, um, which is a change that we did make. And um, that was part of our addressing the, the long-term financial vision. Um, but what we didn't anticipate was that our deputy director would step back, would, would resign and uh, retire. And um, we didn't anticipate that another full-time employee who would um, opt to do, step back to part-time employment. And, um, and we didn't anticipate that our um, senior accountant position would become vacant. Um, so those were, those were curveballs that we didn't see. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have some redundancy in finance, um, at, like in, in other departments, but not a lot of depth. So we can usually take one hit in a department, but multiples um, leave us short. And in this case, um, all three of those, um, four of those employees I just mentioned had specific skills that uh, were not easily replicated. One of the takeaways for me is that um, in all of our departments, and finance, finance included, um, I'd like to see, uh, I'll be asking managers to um, present um, a cross-training plan to me so that we know that we've got thorough uh, redundancy um, among staff to cover each other. And that happens already. Um, if somebody's away on accounts receivable or accounts payable or payroll, somebody else is trained. But that depth is often only one person deep citywide. And we'll be looking to try to make some uh, deeper depth, if you can use that term, um, in, in many areas. Thank it's you. a challenge. We didn't anticipate this happening. And do you think that um, it's still reasonable for us to have reduced that full-time position to a half-time position going forward or are we seeing that we need that to be full-time? Um, no, the director um, did not disagree that that was a, a change we could make. Um, it unfortunately compounded what happened here. And then there's some, there's some uh, you can appreciate it, um, in a unionized environment, there's a process to posting positions and a timeline to that and then a timeline to people um, who are successful in postings, being able to say, yeah, this isn't for me. Um, I'm going to go back to my old, revert to my old position. So we've had a little bit of that happening, um, and that has prevented us from being able to fill those positions permanently more, more quickly. So we have to try internally first, and uh, I can tell you that last week we hired a full-time employee internally for finance and a full-time employee externally for finance. So we're, we're in much better shape as those people come online. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor McClellan, and then uh, Councillor Allen. Can you wrap this up for us? Yeah, thank you very much. I guess the, the biggest concern I have is that we as council are responsible for the finances of the city of Port Alberni. And I know we've got big insurance policies and that if we kind of blow it, but we don't want to be using that. So we should have a way of knowing what is happening. If there's a reason for the happen, there's a reason for the happen, but we should know. And uh, you're right, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can't be no one to beat a dead horse I guess uh, the horse has already left the barn on this one but also I'd like us to uh, note that uh, the letter that was written to the government promising the entire world is now going to be good was signed by our city clerk and probably doesn't have a whole lot of input in what happens uh, in the finance department so I think we should make sure that she isn't uh, left out to dry on, on that and make sure that it does happen and finally, I, I would like to know if we had have uh, an exit interview with the employees that left, because my opinion is, and my guess is, that if you suddenly have a whole bunch of people leave you didn't count on, there may be some unhappiness or some, some reason they went that couldn't be seen, and maybe it's unhappy with the job, and there may be a reason that we could correct. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you're able to comment on that, CAO, or not. I, I can tell you that we do um, exercise the practice of exit interviews, and I know the Deputy Director of Finance w um, went through an exit interview process. Uh, I don't know that the other unionized employees um, who um, have left have gone through an exit interview process. I can check that. Okay, thank you. And finishing and, up? And by, if it's not obvious, I'm not involved in the exit interview process, so that's why I'm not aware. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Alamani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question was really kind of covered by council and minions but just to be clear for the for the public just so that they're you know sort of put at ease as to the the current status of the finance department um, are so all of those positions are are filled and the the department is you know operating normally again no I wouldn't say that um, we've hired two people yesterday the last week sorry and uh, one of them will start I believe next week and the other one that is external won't start for several weeks 
um, and they will both have to learn the jobs and there'll be a lot of training. Um, the deputy director of finance is, is fairly new to us still. We just hired um, her a few months ago. Um, so there's a lot of learning there as well. Um, there's some internal moves as well. Um, our um, payroll clerk has just moved to the accountant position internally. So there's some learning there on, on that, that person's part um, in the accountant role. And um, I'm not sure yet if we posted, if we completed the posting for payroll, but there's, there's a lot of cross training going on right now. Um, it didn't help that we just went through tax season when if you come to City Hall you see a lineup of um, taxpayers and waiting to be served by by finance department staff um, and when they're doing that at the front desk they're not at their desk doing their other work so we've just come through a really tough time for the department so we're, we're on our way to being um, staff fully staffed and fully functional but we're not there yet okay and uh, Councillor Alamani do you want to move for receipt of the CEO's report then please uh, that the letter dated July 23rd, 2018. Uh, uh, if we could do the just oh, the CEO's the report on the green uh, the green page. Oh, yep. Wrong one. That the report from the CAO dated August 13th, providing information regarding the 2017 financial statements be received. Second, second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, now, okay. Councillor Alamani, if you want to go on to those. Uh, that the letter dated July 23rd, 2018, advising that the City of Port Alberni has not complied with the Community Charter legislation requiring financial information be submitted by May 15th each year be received. The seconder? Second. Second, Mr. Mayor. All in favor? Carried. And that the report dated August 1st, 2018 from the Director of Finance concerning uh, financial reporting submission deadlines be received. Second, Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, Council, that brings us to uh, safety concerns from Alf Thompson, uh, Westport. We have a letter regarding traffic and pedestrian safety concerns on the Westport area. Uh, any questions, Council? Any concerns? Any comments? Then, Councillor Paulson, do you want to? Move uh, direction for that letter, then, please. I'd like to move that the letter dated August 2nd, 2018, concerning traffic and pedestrian safety concerns in the Westport area of Port Alberni, be received with thanks and referred to the Director of Engineering and Public Works and the City's Advisory Traffic Committee. I'll second that motion. Discussion? All in favor? Carried. Brings us to proclamations then, Council. First one is about the uh, toy run. We've been e uh, email from the toy run uh, dated July 23rd requesting that the week of September 10th to 16th 2018 be proclaimed as toy run week in Port Alberni and Councillor Washington are you able to make that thank you Mr. Mayor I move that the email dated July 23rd 2018 requesting that the week of September 10 to 16 2018 be proclaimed as toy run week in Port Alberni I'll second that Mr. Mayor all in favor carried and then, uh, Council, we have uh, some informational correspondence and uh, turn it over to the City Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A few items, a letter from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction regarding BC's Homelessness Action Plan, including data on Port Alberni's homeless count and encouraging applications for provincial funding for affordable housing. BC Hydro provides a copy of their summer 2018 Vancouver Island report copy of a letter from the City of Williams Lake to um, Minister Carol James regarding the employer health tax and the impact on local governments, RCMP Municipal Policing Agreement expenditures to June the 30th, minutes of the July 18th Advisory Traffic Committee meeting, um, a letter from Premier uh, John Horgan concerning amendments to the Pension Benefits Standards Regulation in an effort to ensure pension entitlements for current and retired Catalyst employees would be secure if the company were to sell their operations. Minutes of the May 3rd and June 7th Food Security and Climate Disruption Committee meeting. Um, and lastly, a letter from the Ministry of Finance, Gaming Policy and Enforcement Branch advising that the um, $119,608 payment to the city representing casino revenue for the period to June 30th um, was being submitted shortly and there is also an attached report from the Director of Finance providing further information on that. Okay, anything you wish to pull out, Council, on any of these? 
And Councillor Sobey, can you move receipt of these, please? That all information, all the correspondence item number one through eight be received and filed. Second? Second, Second Mr. Mayor. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, there is no report from in camera. We haven't had that meeting yet. Uh, so that brings us to uh, council reports. Um, council minds uh, fairly brief. Uh, attended the the Pride uh, event at uh, Gyro Park on July 29th uh, and, and uh, was pleased to provide opening comments for that event. Uh, it was a hot, hot day, but uh, a great event and a good location. Uh, thank you to the councillors that uh, volunteered to get wet to raise money. Uh, August the 6th, I uh, attended on behalf of council uh, the nautical days in Comox, as I have in each one of the previous three summers. Uh, another great and successful event. Um, August the 9th, I attended a, a meeting at the Barclay Hotel uh, about the um, an initiative to bring First Nations courts, uh, uh, First Nation court to Port Alberni and more on that uh, uh, later. And um, August 10th to 12th, of course, uh, attended the Shaker at McLean's Mill. So it was a very successful event. Council, uh, move acceptance of my report. Second. All in favor? Carried. And regional district report, uh, Councilor McClemon. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, like the City Council, there's just one regional district meeting in July, and it was the part that concerned the city, I guess, and, and uh, all of the areas was taken up mostly by uh, discussion on, on marijuana, pot, or whatever you want to call that stuff, uh, and how to implement a uh, recreational marijuana situation, and they've kind of decided to a, make sure it's in a commercially zoned area, which they have very few and small amount of, and, and it has to be referred as by the law by, from the uh, provincial government. But the concern I have, I guess, uh, as part of the report, or what maybe I'll comment later, is it doesn't, they don't seem to be uh, coordinating with our city staff on how many places anywhere. They're sort of hoping that the, uh, um, commercial area limitation will solve it and everyone tried to convince me to the only thing I had to fear was fear itself but um, we've already been down this road so I'll t on my report I'll talk about that and maybe make some motions and notice some motions later so I, I on that Mr. Mayor I would uh, like to move the uh, acceptance of my report as that was uh, the main part of it all in favor carried thank you and that Bring us, brings us to Councillor's reports. Uh, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I'll just be like Director Thorpe and harp on our, our town program so far this year. Uh, July 10th, Wild Ball West at Blair Park. Um, 500 uh, um, ice cream sandwiches went out. So I mean, at least 500 kids, and I'm sure they toted their parents in line too. So uh, a great turnout there. July 24th, Real Life Heroes. At Jaro, it was a new event for us, but the nice thing about it is the BC Ambulance Service, the Fire Department, the RCMP, and the Rescue Squad all came out in their gear, and uh, these young little boys and girls got to meet up with uh, real life policemen and real life firemen, and uh, I'm sure that will make things a little bit calmer if they ever have to be approached or even have to approach a, a man in uniform. Uh, big thanks to those. Uh, all the branches of services that did show up. And for account, uh, Kiwanis um, handed out over 700 snow cones that day. So, so there was at least 700 people at that event too. So that's great. Uh, August 8th, we had the Mexican Fiesta at uh, Bob Daly um, and then into the movie night. So uh, very busy, but quite spread out, but uh, very busy there. A big thank you to Gyro for, uh, host, er, for coming in and, and doing hot dogs for the last two events. Uh, past weekend, 11 and 12, I was down at Thunder in the Valley. So uh, sorry I missed the shaker, but uh, after uh, helping Kiwanis with their burgers and stuff, by 6 o'clock that night, you're pretty tired. It's sort of a prelude to our salmon festival, so looking forward to that. And then, of course, today, the audit committee. And August 21st at Harbor Key, we'll, we'll take to the sky as our last uh, Our Town program for 2018, and that's my report. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Alamany. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, just a short report uh, at uh, at the Pride uh, event last month. Um, I was happy to be in the dunk tank because it was the coolest place to be. It was a ridiculously hot day, um, but a really great event. Um, so very happy to attend that. Um, I uh, attended my first uh, advisory traffic commission meeting since we hadn't had one since uh, November, I think was the last one. So I, had, I wasn't actually on the committee at that time. So, uh, so that was very interesting. Uh, and the minutes are in the uh, in the agenda today, and then uh, and then we had a food security climate disruption committee uh, meeting last week, so um, that went great. Uh, and I already uh, already talked about five acre shaker. Didn't get down to the um, to the thunder in the valley, but uh, uh, can always hear it from my house. It was good. <laughs> so thank you. And Councilor Minions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did the dunk tank for Pride as well. I don't normally do dunk tanks because I hate dunk tanks. But um, the water, I would disagree with Councillor Alamay. It was uncomfortably lukewarm. <laughs> um, <After> but <laughs> that's right, I was first. <laughs> it was not good. Um, anyways, it was a great event. Um, nice to see so many people out for that. A really good cross section of the community, and the organizers did just a fantastic job. Um, I, like a lot of other people, have been um, concerningly watching the forest fires, um, and the forest firefighters have obviously done a great job. I'm glad the city was able to help on that. Um, but I want to thank the city management and communications manager for um, a really good job keeping the public informed. Um, I think that this is a drastic step from how we engaged um, on social media and um, in the public during the um, tsunami evacuation and I think it shows the development of that position and um, I've heard a ton of comments around the community um, about how nice it was that not only were we posting on social media but actually responding um, to people's questions in those comments as well so a really good job done to everybody involved in that. Um, I attended Thunder in the Valley um, my children made it about 45 minutes in the noise, which was a step up from last year. So um, really good event, um, lots of fun to go down there, even if for a short period of time. I attended the regional district meeting on cannabis as well um, and learned a lot there. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Councillor McClemon has for notices of motion, because I think that's going to be a really challenging um, issue for us to kind of adapt to as more information and other communities' experiences come out. And the last thing I'll comment on is the Sashat, I attended the Sashat celebration of the anniversary of the closure of the residential school. I believe it was 45 years. Um, it was a really beautiful ceremony and I'm thankful to have had the opportunity to be there. Um, the people who planned it just did a fantastic job um, and I think it is a really great step to educating people to kind of the history and not so nice history of some parts of our community. So that's my report. Thank you. And Councillor Paulson? Um, on July the 16th, uh, I attended a very brief um, get together with the Parliamentary Secretary for Emergency Management BC, and uh, uh, they were on their way out to Tofino, so we had a very quick discussion there. Um, and then on the 19th of the same week, um, there was an Alberni Valley Emergency Planning Meeting, so it was kind of timely. On the 25th, attended the ACRD meeting as an alternate. On August the 8th, uh, I attended the Kuas Crisis Line um, um, celebration of 20 f their, their, their 25th anniversary, and um, uh, be certainly became more aware of the services that they provide, and they've gone from a very small, um, uh, starter to being recognized provincially and actually being a provincial coordinator and actually they have been um, asked to become a federal coordinator and um, their their particular structure is uh, being uh, being used in other parts of the country and um, I was privileged to be involved in uh, all the guests there um, we were involved in a blanket ceremony, and it was a great privilege for me to be involved in that and be, um, be recognized. On the 11th and 12th, um, Thunder in the Valley it did, it was doing 50-50 out there, and somebody on the Sunday morning won uh, almost $2,500 on, on a 50-50, so somebody's pretty happy. And uh, certainly today was the audit committee report. And the last thing was West Coast Prep Camp just wound up on uh, on the weekend, and there was well over 900 participants this year, 
and uh, they're extremely ecstatic about being involved in our community and they're extremely ecstatic about the reception that they receive in our community and and half of those 930 actually come from out of town and actually stay in hotels or uh, other places in our community the other half are actually dormed um, in dorms portable dorms so you know it's a really good program for our for our community so that's my report Okay, thank you. And Councillor Sobe? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On July 10th, uh, I attended uh, Ord Town festivities, and it was the Wild West theme. It was a very hot evening, so uh, we survived that, so uh, it was a privilege for me to volunteer for that. Um, on July 12th, we had the Uptown Merchants um, little festival going out, and local talents and all the stores opening up. It was very well attended, and uh, so I appreciate all the volunteers and the Uptown Merchants for putting that together. Uh, July 21st, uh, we had the Kinsman Soapbox Derby down on Argyle, which was uh, amazing attendance and people showing. A lot of community members showed up and gave support to our local youth. We had uh, approximately just over 40 entries uh, braving to come down that Argyle Hill. So everything worked out fine and uh, and uh, kudos to the Kinsmen for putting uh, such an event together to raising funds for our community and people in, in needs. On July 29th, the Pride event, uh, I was able to volunteer and interact with the community there. It was a fun event. Uh, worked at the food tent and also had the privilege to go in the dunk tank. And of course we had our audit committee meeting today, so now will be my report. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor McClellan? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I attended some of the other me meetings that have already been mentioned. And for brevity, I did enjoy the uh, soapbox at uh, Derby. It, it, I think the new track down us, the lower part of Argyle was much, uh, a lot of faster and seemed to work a lot better. And so, and also I could sit and have lunch in the shade while I was watching my grandson come down. So that kind of made it good. Um, also went, attended the uh, uh, drags yesterday and I think they went really well they weren't quite very quiet I got to turn my hearing aids right down I could still hear them for all for quite a bit but it was good and uh, the 50 50 is what I was working on for the Bulldogs and someone in the afternoon got a thousand and some dollars so uh, in the morning it was over two thousand and the day before there was thousand and eight hundred or something so I think it was well attended, well supported, and very well run program. So with that, I would move the acceptance of all these wonderful reports. All in favor? Carried. Uh, Council, that brings us to uh, new business. Uh, I do have a, a notice of motion. That's about First Nations Court. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Vice President of the NTC, uh, Andy Calicum, was here but had to leave. He, uh, I thought we would finish closer to 3.30, so obviously I was way off. <laughs> Um, I've been uh, working on behalf of Council to look at new ways to uh, reduce crime. Um, BC has uh, specialized First Nations courts in several communities in the province, including North Vancouver, which includes Squamish and Whistler and Duncan and Prince George. Uh, Council has had the opportunity to participate in uh, one meeting with uh, Minister Fraser, uh, I think, and the NTC was there as well. Um, Provincial government uh, develops these courts in consultation with local First Nations and the community at large, as well as police, Crown Council, defense lawyers, and others. Uh, so First Nations courts aim to provide uh, support to assist in rehabilitation and to reduce recidivism. On August the 9th, I, as I mentioned, I attended a joint meeting at the Barclay regarding the potential establishment of a First Nations court in Port Alberni. Attendees included Chief Judge, the new Chief Judge, Melissa Gillespie, the Vice President and President of uh, the NTC and representatives of various other organizations. So the NTC, uh, the New Channel Tribal Council, is leading the efforts for the establishment of First Nations Courts, uh, in uh, a First Nations Court in Port Alberni. And I want to thank them for their leadership on this. Uh, so I'd like to make a notice of motion that at the next council meeting, uh, council provide a letter of support for the establishment of First Nations Courts in Port Alberni. Uh, anything else, Council, under new business? As Councillor McClemon? Yeah, I would just make a notice of motion and I'll prepare it out later to uh, 
the staff prepare bylaws for recreational marijuana use and how it's going to interact with medical marijuana and our distances between. And I think that's all I have to say. I don't need a second or anything, but I'll, there'll be probably two to three motions uh, coming up from that subject. And just one comment, I guess. Um, I see there's another dispensary. It was a pretty loose term for same. Uh, up on Redford Street at one of the hotels. I found that. I don't know how that fits with our bylaw, but I think we should be having a look. We, yeah, we did ask about that. And Councillor uh, Sobe. In response to Councillor McLennan's uh, request and notice motion, are we not already waiting for a report from staff? For we are waiting for a report from staff on that. Okay, anything else? Then uh, this is question period. It's an opportunity for press to ask questions. And they're studiously avoiding me, so no, that's not happening. Uh, then, um, council, I proclaim a 10-minute recess. We've been sitting for three hours. And uh, then we'll move ourselves into uh, in camera. Second that if it's a motion to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> OK, a motion to adjourn. Thank you. All in favor. No.